Hello, good morning. It's seven o'clock. In the next few minutes, we'll be speaking to the business secretary, Kemi Badenoch. We'll ask her about Rishi Sunak's decision to hit the brakes in the race to net zero and the backlash from climate scientists, industry and some conservatives. It's Thursday, the 21st of September. The Prime Minister's move to delay key commitments on climate change shattered a consensus that he believes has an unaffordable price. We'll now have a more pragmatic, proportionate and realistic approach that eases the burdens on families. Rishi Sunak delayed the ban on new petrol and diesel cars and said households will never be forced to rip out their existing boilers. Also ahead, three out of four rape survivors tell a new study they were harmed by the way police investigated their case. Interest rates could go up again when the Bank of England meets at midday, but yesterday's fall in inflation gives hope to millions of homeowners. And a toast to the Entente Cordiale. The stars turn out for the king at a Versailles banquet. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Rishi Sunak could have taken the biggest gamble of his career yesterday. He's provoked a tsunami of criticism from climate scientists, car makers and some conservative critics by dumping green policies. But he will hope that by easing the burden on so-called hard-pressed families, he's put himself on the right side of public opinion. A fifth of all homes will be exempted from the requirement to install a heat pump if they are replacing their existing boiler after 2035. Along with the new exemption, cash grants from people who want to make the change now will increase from 5,000 to 7,500 pounds. The ban on sales of new petrol and diesel cars will be delayed from 2030 to 2035. And the requirement for privately rented homes to have an energy efficiency rating of C or better by 2028 has been abandoned. But Rishi Sunak says he's still committed to net zero. We are forecast and we have committed to reduce our carbon emissions by 2030 by 68%. There is no other advanced economy in the world who comes close to that kind of commitment. That's a commitment that we're sticking to today. It's a commitment that we're confident we can deliver. Just to give you a sense, what's, we're at 68%. Where's the EU? 55%. Australia, 45%. America, Japan, 40. Canada, 20. New Zealand, 18. Well, I'm joined by our political correspondent, Mario Aurora. Mario, this is a big political gamble, isn't it? It really is a big political gamble. And uh, Rishi Sunak is really hoping it's going to be paying off, that voters will come with him and see this as a kind of pragmatic approach. But obviously, we know so many critics have already said they think it's actually more short term than long term, despite the Prime Minister trying to say this is all about long term decision making. So we know, for instance, uh, you know, Andy Street last night on the Politics Hub on Sky News, he even said he didn't agree with the timing of the car ban moving back to 2035. Uh, so I think there is a lot of kind of blue on blue that is happening at the moment. Although I think so far the majority of Tory MPs I've spoken to are actually relatively happy with it. They think it's quite measured, it's quite reasonable. But we know, for instance, Zach Goldsmith, he said it's cynical beyond belief and reprehensible that Rishi Sunak has been speaking about, you know, tax on meat, seven bins, all those kinds of things that were never government policy. And the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson himself has been speaking to the media as well. So we've got a, a statement here from Boris Johnson that says it is crucial that we give those businesses confidence that government is still committed to net zero and and we can see the way ahead. We cannot afford to falter now or in any way lose our ambition for this country. Now, obviously, it's important to remember that Boris Johnson, this was part of the manifesto he stood on. It was. And, and in terms of reaction, obviously, a lot of reaction here in the UK, but what about wider international reaction? Well, internationally, this is the real key concern. I mean, I've spoken to a Tory MP who's very concerned about how this damages potentially uh, kind of international standing. One MP said to me that they felt it was particularly offensive that this uh, announcement came during the UNGA uh, event. So that's the UN General Assembly uh, that Oliver Dowden has been attending. The Prime Minister did not go to that. And when we asked the Prime Minister's spokesperson earlier this week, why he wasn't going to that spokesperson said he was too busy now we know why um, but also I mean Al Gore a big kind of political heavyweight in the US has been speaking to Sky News and he's not best pleased about this policy announcement 
Well, I think it's unfortunate uh, that he would do that. And I think the people of the United Kingdom largely agree that it's the wrong decision. Do you have a message that, for the Prime Minister, for people, that, That's for people of the United Kingdom to address, and I is certainly disagree back? with him. Is it going to set back the course? Well, he's doing the wrong thing. So, as you can see there, internationally, we're doing the wrong thing. That's what Al Gore says. But also, we've got Kimmy Badenoch, the uh, is business secretary, on this morning. You're going to be grilling her. And I think the public are going to want to know, is the UK still a safe and steady environment for the likes of car manufacturers and other international businesses to invest? OK, we will be putting that question to her and many others coming up in a short while. Well, Sky's People and Politics correspondent Nick Martin has been to Morley and Outwood, the constituency of the Conservative P, Andrea Jenkins who told Sky News that people there don't buy into net zero policies. So this is my uh, combination boiler. Gordon is into his green technology like solar power, but he says he's not ready to give up his gas boiler just yet. He also happens to have been a plumber for 25 years. These are the go-to boiler for ah, yeah. millions of people, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. And the, government, the government's plan was to phase these out. What was the problem with that and the time scale, do you think? I think the, the problem that they've always had is that it was an unrealistic target. And it sounds great, but it's impractical. Getting the UK to net zero will require huge changes to how we all live. The Prime Minister says households who will struggle to make the switch will be exempt from replacing boilers for heat pumps. That's a crucial sweetener for a fifth of households who, with this change, won't need expensive upgrades. Ultimately, international agreements on climate change were always perhaps going to be balanced with the needs of real people and what they can actually afford the Prime Minister now calculating that going too fast could serve to alienate struggling voters in constituencies like this one. There are now more than 800,000 electric cars in Britain. Sales have boomed since the government committed to ban the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030. It looks like motorists will now have another five years to hit that expensive target. Personally, I believe it does need to be pushed further into the future, um, so the government have got time to put the infrastructure into place because there isn't enough fast chargers when people are out on the road on a daily basis. This sort of policy doesn't surprise me, and I feel like it's definitely done as a, as a vote winner um, rather than um, done with good conscience, um, and it's quite symptomatic of constantly changing cabinet and changing prime ministers. This surprise announcement by the government is certainly a major policy U-turn, but in the eyes of voters, it could recharge the government's flagging popularity. Nick Martin, Sky News, Leeds. Well, the Prime Minister's announcement is dominating the morning newspapers. And I have the to say, Sun says Rishi Sunak has given us a break. At last, they comment in their editorial, the Tories have something to sell on the doorstep. The Mail praises the Prime Minister for taking on what it calls eco-zealots. The Express brands him Honest Rishi. And, the, and Sunak spares public net zero pain is the similarly supportive headline in The Telegraph. Not everybody's totally on side. The Times calls the decision to hit the brakes on green commitments a gamble. And The Guardian brands it a green bonfire, pointing out the furious reaction from industry and the despair of climate scientists. The FT also focuses on the backlash from business. Well, in other news, three quarters of rape and sexual assault survivors say their mental health was harmed by the way that police investigated their case. 2,000 people were interviewed in England and Wales as part of a government-funded programme called Operation Soteria Bluestone. Well, 75% of those interviewed said that they were negatively impact impacted by what police did or didn't do while investigating their crime. More than half of respondents said they'd be unlikely to report a rape to police again. And about a quarter of rape and sexual abuse survivors felt that officers understood what it was like for them. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Rachel Venables, who joins me here in the studio. Rachel, tell us a bit more about this research. 
Well, it doesn't get much more damning for the police in England and Wales than this survey. You've just been going through those numbers there. Absolutely staggering that the majority of these 2,000 victims of either rape or sexual assault who came forward to this Home Office-funded research said that the impact of speaking to the police, either because they didn't believe them, they didn't treat them properly, maybe they didn't understand them or they didn't take proper steps to affect them, negatively impacted their mental health. And you can imagine for rape and sexual assault survivors how important that first contact, that contact with the police is, both when it comes to validating how they feel about their experience and trying to bring somebody to justice, but also crucially about trying to protect them into the future and to protect other people as well. You just went through some of those numbers. Um, really quite staggering. One survivor even telling researchers they are actually more afraid of the police than of being raped again. So three quarters are saying their mental health worsened as a direct result of what the police did. More than half of respondents saying they were unlikely to report uh, a rape to the police again. The research itself led by the National Police uh, Chiefs Council in a bid to try and improve the judicial process for rape and sexual assault survivors. You know, of course, how in recent years, charging rates for things like rape has dropped to record lows. And you've got some campaigners saying that conviction rates are so low, it's effectively been decriminalised in this country. Uh, the research was led by Pro Professor Catherine Hall uh, from City University, and she said the results really were sobering, the impact that poor policing would have on survivors. When investigations go poorly, the impact long term and immediately on survivors can be quite severe. Three out of four said their mental health got worse. 50% said it had impact on their physical health. 40% say they feel less safe. And we've seen in the survey evidence of survivors being unprotected and saying it's emboldened their perpetrators to carry on offending. So a lot in there to be concerned about, but there were good signs as well. I mean, I think from the outset, we need to stress that the survey said that many respondents came to them speaking about police officers who'd done amazingly, who'd protected them, who'd gone above and beyond and really made them see, uh, feel safe and believed, but they were a minority. Interestingly enough, though, there were signs of improvement uh, with people who said that they'd reported a rape or sexual assault in the last three months, uh, nearly double uh, likely to basically say that they were pleased with the result that the police had had shown them. So possible reassuring signs there, but still a long way to go. OK, Rachel, thanks very much. Iran's parliament has approved a bill to impose harsher penalties on women who refuse to wear the Islamic headscarf in public. Offenders face up to 10 years in prison and there are also tougher punishments for anyone who supports them. Well, the change has been made just days after the anniversary of the death in custody of Masa Amini, which ignited months of anti-government protests. It's thought parents no longer believe their children must attend school every day since the coronavirus pandemic. That's according to the consultancy Public First, which found parents taking their children on holiday during term time is now seen as socially acceptable. Airbnb says it's cracking down on fake listings, removing 59,000 of them so far this year. Fake listings have been a major problem for Airbnb as it's scaring off customers. The San Francisco-based company has been using artificial intelligence to crack down on fraudsters. A century after oysters disappeared from the Firth of Forth near Edinburgh, they are back. A restoration project hopes to eventually reintroduce 30,000 oysters to the estuary, filtering the water and improving fish numbers and seagrass. Oysters were wiped out by both overfishing and pollution. Now, in a historic first, the King will address the French Senate this morning. Joining me live from Paris is Royal Correspondent Laura Bundock. A busy day for the King and Queen yesterday, Laura, uh, and a, a very fancy dinner last night. But what's happening today? Well, it's another busy day, frankly, after all the ceremony yesterday, starting at the Arc de Triomphe and then heading to the Palace of Versailles. And I think you have to say the French really have done all they can to make the King and Queen feel welcome. It's very interesting looking at some of the French papers today. One of them describing as this visit shining a light, a soothing light to restore a damaged friendship. Others, frankly, just happy to see Mick Jagger on a red carpet at Versailles. But you're right, the engagements continue today. The King going to the Senate. He'll be the first British monarch to ever address the Senate from the floor of the 
the chamber there. He'll be speaking to both houses, a speech in both English and French. It'll really set the tone, I think, of this visit. Every word, every theme will have been carefully thought about. And although, of course, the government will approve what he says, I think we can expect some personal touches. He is bound to talk about his late mother and her connection with France, how much she loved France, how much she used to visit as well. I think also it'll be interesting to see how it goes down, how it was received when he gave the speech to the Bundestag in Germany back in March. It lasted 23 minutes and had a two-minute standing ovation at the end. So watch out for the reactions after his speech. After that, though, the day really continues apace. Seven more engagements from sport to a visit to see how the renovations and repairs of Notre Dame are going on after that devastating fire. So another busy day on day two of this state visit. And, of course, the couple then heading to Bordeaux tomorrow for more. OK, Laura, thanks very much. While King Charles is scheduled to make his historic address in the French Senate chamber at 9.40 this morning, we'll bring that to you live. Now, it's just possible that the Bank of England will meet today and decide not to put up interest rates. That would surprise most economists still, but the decision is looking more finely balanced after yesterday's unexpected fall in inflation. Here's our economics and data editor, Ed Conway. In the real economy, where oil, gas and fuel are still all important, the shadow of energy prices still looms large, especially in the haulage business. In the last three months, um, we've seen a huge increase um, in the region of 17.5%, which in real terms puts our bill up um, about half a million pounds a year, um, which is obviously somewhere around £10,000 a week. The rate of inflation is now coming down, but prices are still rising. I know we had good news with the inflation, but uh, figures being lower than expected. But I don't think the fuel price increases have sort of got filtered into that yet, um, which they certainly will during September. Still, there is now a glimmer of hope in the data, for not only did inflation fall to 6.7% in August, it's falling faster than expected. You get a sense of that from this chart. The bars show you how much above or below economists' expectations inflation actually came in. For most of recent history, inflation was higher than expected. Those bars were in the red territory. But now look at August, that bar on the far right. It was further below expectations than at any point in the cost of living crisis. So what does it mean in practice? Well, for one thing, that target set by the Prime Minister and Chancellor of halving inflation by the end of the year looks a bit more likely. On the other side of town, the Bank of England may be less likely to raise interest rates, although most economists think they still will do. But it's worth just taking a step back here. Why is inflation falling? In part, it's because people have less money to spend. That is a recessionary signal. And that signal is coming across here in the hospitality sector. I would say people are careful with money now. They know that they're under pressure and there's a semi-recessionary mentality without a full recession. So they are going out a bit less, spending a bit less when they're out. In short, probably a bit too early to be popping champagne corks. But with inflation now falling faster than expected, perhaps a little glass of Prosecco. Cheers. Ed Conway, Sky News. And we'll bring you live coverage of the Bank of England's interest rate decision. That is from 12 midday here on Sky News. Military veterans who were involved in nuclear weapons tests in the 1950s and 60s are taking their fight for their medical records to court. They say the Ministry of Defence is withholding the records illegally, compounding the trauma and illnesses that they and their families have suffered. Sky correspondent Becky Cottrell reports. These men, a generation apart, both believe they've been poisoned by radiation from nuclear tests carried out by the British government. Veteran John Morris was stationed on Christmas Island in the South Pacific in the 1950s. I was there for four atomic bombs. The nearest was 20 miles away. And I had a pair of shorts, a shirt on and sunglasses. And it was like sitting in the centre of the sun. John developed anemia and was later diagnosed with cancer, like many others he served with. He went on to have children, but his son died when he was a baby. John believes it's all because of radiation and says his medical records from the time should show this. 
I know for a fact that I had urine and blood samples taken, and they are not recorded. But the MOD suggests they were never taken. Steve Purse was born with a series of disabilities. His father, David, ran an airfield in Australia where nuclear weapons tests were carried out. Steve has been trying to get hold of his dad's medical files. I had an email just this week from the RAF um, saying, yes, the MOD search has found the information you require, but no, you can't have it. And they're quoting some law about confidentiality. What are they hiding? It's as if they know that what Dad was exposed to probably caused my condition and they just don't want me to have him. In order to find out what really happened to his father, he's launching legal action along with veterans and other relatives. In a statement, the Ministry of Defence said it remains the case that no information is withheld from veterans and any medical record taken either before, during or after participation in the UK nuclear weapons tests are held in individual military medical records in the government's archives, which can be accessed on request. But that's not the experience of those like John and David. They are demanding answers to improve their own medical care, but also to show genetic risks their loved ones might be exposed to. Becky Cottrell, Sky News. The Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is to meet US President Joe Biden in Washington today. The visit comes as Congress is debating a proposal from the White House to provide as much as $24 billion in military and humanitarian aid for Ukraine. Sky's US correspondent Mark Stone has more. Yes, a critical day ahead for the Ukrainian president. Zelensky will need his trademark presence, his poise and his powers of persuasion to drive home to American politicians why this fight is theirs too. Do not abandon us now will be his message. He'll meet President Biden at the White House, of course. He'll visit military leaders at the Pentagon. But I think the crux of this visit will be Capitol Hill, where he will find an influential number of doubting politicians who could block the ongoing American funding for the war. You know, I think it is a sign of the times that the weakest link in the Western alliance against Russian aggression right now seems to be America's Republican Party. While an old guard of Republicans do still inhabit the corridors of the Senate, over in the House of Representatives, where the majority are Republican, there is an air of American first isolationism. Trumpian politicians are threatening to force a government shutdown if their deep opposition to Ukrainian funding and other issues are not addressed. They say America is writing blank checks to Ukraine. In fact, the war is costing each American the equivalent of about 50p a day. Zelensky will try to persuade them that it is their war too, that his counteroffensive is working, that Putin will lose, but only if they back him. Mark Stone there. Well, uh, let's talk now to the Business Secretary, Kemi Badenoch. Uh, thanks very much for coming in this morning. Uh, well, only one big story in town today, and this is the Prime Minister's uh, extraordinary press conference yesterday, the rowing back on these enormous green pledges. Is the Prime Minister prepared to let the planet burn just to get voters from elderly car owners? Absolutely not. And that's certainly not what the announcement yesterday was about. This was about making sure that our transition to net zero is done in a fair and proportionate way. It needs to be something that is affordable, otherwise we won't have the consent of the British public to do the right thing. That's not what former Tory MP Zach Goldsmith says. He says this is cynical beyond belief. The Prime Minister is pretending to halt frightening proposals that simply do not exist. He's doing it to turn the environment into a US-style political wedge issue, something the UK has avoided all my political life. Sunak is chucking the environment into a political fire purely to score points. It is reprehensible. That's from, from a Conservative. Yeah, yeah, I know Zach Goldsmith very well. He is a friend. I fundamentally disagree. Let me finish. I fundamentally disagree with what he has said. We are listening to the concerns people are raising with us. Most people in this country don't have the kind of money that he has. We have to think about what people can reasonably afford. We have people who are not connected to the gas grid, who are being made to make changes, there are people you know, who use oil tanks and so on, that are simply not feasible. 
we are looking at supply chain issues around batteries, where last time I sat on this sofa, we were talking about China, and uh, you were asking me whether it was, uh, China was a friend or foe. Electric vehicles, the supply chains for those rely on uh, Chinese batteries mostly. We have to think about that. We need to make sure that what we're doing is right for the UK. This is not uh, some, sort of cynical, uh, some sort of cynical ploy. I've been the business secretary now for almost a year. I know what businesses are saying. This is not just about big business. There's small business to think about. This is the right thing to do, and I fully support the Prime Minister. You, you mentioned the last time we sat here. It was nine days ago. Mm -hmm. You were off to Cowley to launch the, the, the Mini's new EV plan. Mm -hmm. Did you know then that the government was going to row back on these pledges? Well, I had been making uh, representations to the Prime Minister. He had not made uh, his decision uh, known to all of us, but these were, these were conversations that we were having. So I'm quite pleased that, um, that this has happened. But that was on Monday. On Friday, I had another big announcement where we are, we're saving Port Talbot, the Tata steel plant, at a cost of £500 million. That's the single biggest carbon emitter in the UK. So it is wrong to say that we're not serious about net zero when we're spending quite a lot of money making serious decisions like that, which don't just help save the planet, but also save jobs and help to regenerate entire areas. But it's massive mixed messages to business, isn't it? And Ford reaction yesterday, our business needs three things from the UK government, ambition, commitment and consistency. Mm -hmm. And a relaxation of these rules undermines all three. Mm -hmm. This Conservative government is undermining business, nope. according to no, one big not. business, Ford. Uh, first of all, Ford made that statement without even hearing what the announcement was. So this is what happens when people respond to social media speculation rather than listening to what the government is actually they saying. Haven't they haven't changed uh, their views they since haven't, the but, statement. But other, but other car companies have come out and said something different. Toyota, for example. And what I would say, without naming any further companies, is that businesses tell government a lot more than what you might uh, see in a corporate press release about the challenges which they are facing. And we take all of that into account when we make our decisions. But in terms of, of the goalposts that have now changed, that has changed, the date of 2030 to 2035 for the, the banning of, of new uh, diesel and petrol cars. Mm. But the staging posts on the way, for example, in this January coming up, 22% mm. of, of these cars that have mm. to be produced have to be electric. Yeah. Those aren't changing yet. So you can see where business is coming from, that they are getting mixed messages from the government and no stability. No, no, not, not at all. In fact, what that does is give them the certainty and the consistency, which they're talking about, in the near term, while providing flexibilities for people in the longer term. This is the right balance to strike, and I think it's the right thing to do. What we have said is that at 2030, there won't be a complete ban on um, uh, in, uh, uh, ICE vehicles, the petrol and diesel engines. But we expect that by then, with the uh, mandates which we're putting in place, we would have got to about 80% of electric vehicles in the populace, but doing it in a way that people can manage. That's the right thing to do. OK, that's, the, that's one car industry that's commented on. E.ON, let's talk about them. They don't believe it makes economic sense either. Chris Norbury, the chief executive, says that, that Rishi Sunak's plans are condemning people to many more years of living in drafty homes that are expensive to heat in cities clogged with dirty air from fossil fuels, missing out on the economic regeneration that this ambition brings. I mean, do you think that this really makes economic sense if we, if we step aside from, from whether or not it's the right thing to do for the environment? Yes, yes, I do. And I think what I would say to the CEO of Eon is to actually look at what the Prime Minister has announced. Some of the plans we put in place were asking people to make changes that physically could not be done to the homes that they were living in. You can't put a heat bump yeah, uh, you can't put a heat pump in certain types of property. It doesn't necessarily work uh, in cities where you have um, high-rise buildings. We need to make sure that we're doing things that are sensible and actually achievable. We still have the commitment. We still have the commitment to uh, help reduce uh, carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. So the commitment hasn't changed, but we're now doing it in a way that is honest with the public about what the costs are and making sure that people can pay for what it is that we're asking them to do. But these changes, they don't really help the poorest in society, a lot of people would argue. The poorest in society aren't fretting about when they're going to replace their car with an electric car because the poorest in society don't drive in this country. I think, the I poorest think, I think, in society I'm, are not I'm, worried about I'm, installing I'm a heat I'm so pump. sorry, but that is a ludicrous statement. If you step outside of London, come to my constituency, you will find the poorest in society drive because they live in a rural area. That, These rules... No, 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 no. What you said is actually quite astonishing. It is not These, astonishing. It is a third astonishing. of the country doesn't what drive. You, what, the, the third of the country doesn't drive.
own people who cars. Live in cities, it is not astonishing. People who live in cities will be able to deal with this in a way that is quite different from people who live in towns and rural areas. We need to think about everybody, not just the metropolitan bubble. There are poor people bubble. that live in, ci yes, there in, are. in cities across the country. It, this has nothing to do with an urban yes, bubble yes, and metropolitan it, 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 London. I'm afraid... I'm I live afraid, in the countryside and just, I come from Newcastle. Well, I'm afraid that my constituents... I'm afraid bubble. that my constituents raise these concerns all the time and those who are at least able to afford it are the ones who are making the most complaints. And we as a government are thinking about them. So I completely disagree with that assertion. What about those who are poor and living in rented homes in cities or in the countryside who are now not going to get their heating upgraded by their landlord because of this? That is not, that is not what the policy is. We haven't said that there should be no heating upgrades. What we have said is that people won't be forced to change the type of boiler that they have before a certain date. They will still have those. And in fact, what this is doing is making it easier for them because they won't necessarily have to take a more expensive option that might actually be less practical. That is the right thing to do for those, rented, uh, those, those people in rented properties. I put to you criticism from some elements of business, criticism from some politicians, mm. criticism from the international community. Mm. Al Gore said yesterday, the Prime Minister is wrong. We are meant to be world leaders, or at least aspire, aspire to be. Why does the Prime Minister seem to think that simply bringing the UK into line with some countries is better than punching above our weight? We have to do what is right for the UK. Al Gore is not a politician in the UK. Rishi Sunak is the Prime Minister of the UK. I've told you that we as a government have looked at this very carefully. We haven't rushed these announcements. It's not because of any political ploy or any by-election. We've been looking at the numbers. We've been looking at the dates. We've been looking at the macro environment. You look at what's happening with energy costs, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, an electric vehicle uh, is not quite as cheap as it used to be to run. We've been looking at all sorts of things to make sure that what we're asking people to do is something that they can practically do. That's the, that's the right thing. The Prime Minister has made the right decision. Kemi Badenoch, Secretary of State for Business and Trade, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Well, let's just look at our live climate and energy data at the moment. The right half of our screen shows how the UK's power is currently being produced. On the top left, you can see how much warmer the Earth is now than it was in 1880. That's when modern record-keeping began. And finally, bottom left, the total amount of CO2 emissions in millions of tonnes. And Neil Patterson is looking at what the net zero policy shift means politically, economically and for the environment in the Sky News Daily podcast. He's joined by our science correspondent Thomas Moore and Politico's UK editor Jack Blanchard. You can scan the QR code on your screen to listen. Right, let's get the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The unsettled conditions this week mean it's going to be windy with showers or longer spells of rain. Mostly warm and windy out there right now with heavy rain spreading eastwards across Britain. That rain will continue across England and Wales this morning but probably won't reach the far southeast where it'll be mainly fine. Showery conditions will follow in the northwest. Elsewhere, there'll be sunny spells and blustery showers, some heavy and perhaps thundery. A touch warmer overall with strong winds easing in parts of the west. The afternoon will see heavy rain and gusty winds, mostly clearing into East Anglia and the southeast, but severe gales may develop in northwest Scotland. Most places will turn drier and calmer overnight, with chilly conditions developing under clear skies. But the northwest looks wet and windy. Showers will also linger over other parts of the west. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. You're watching Sky News Breakfast coming up. We've just heard from the business secretary say that the government is doing what is right for the UK and delaying climate commitments is not a cynical ploy. I'll ask a pollster shortly what the public thinks. And drowned out by human noise, find out how these critically endangered monkeys are causing a stink to communicate with each other. A secret hospital hidden in the Myanmar jungle, treating the victims of this bloody war. This is hardcore emergency medicine in the hardest of circumstances. So you'll be doing brain surgery today. Uh, maybe. Here, the resistance lives or dies. It's been quite remarkable. You have to see these things, but it's banking hurts when you do it.
pound has rallied. Moderation interest rates peaking and up at 6%. The highest for 14 years. Will that be the peak? Will it be a little bit lower? Prices. It's closer to a potential crash. So many words, so many meanings. But what do they mean for you and your finances? Stay up to date on Sky News. I'm Martha Kellner, and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? I am angry. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to get in, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. Uh, Ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Well, let's go straight back to our lead story. The Prime Minister's decision to put the brakes on net zero commitments. The Business Secretary, Cammy Badenoch, said we have to do what is right for the UK. This is not some cynical ploy. She told this programme a few minutes ago that the government is listening to people's concerns and responded to criticism from the former Conservative Minister, Zach Goldsmith, by saying that most people in this country don't have the money that Goldsmith has. Yeah, I know Zach Goldsmith very well. He is a friend. I fundamentally yes, disagree. Let me finish. I fundamentally disagree with what he has said. We are listening to the concerns people are raising with us. Most people in this country don't have the kind of money that he has. We have to think about what people can reasonably afford. We have people who are not connected to the gas grid, who are being made to make changes, there are people you know, who use oil tanks and so on, that are simply not feasible. We are looking at supply chain issues around batteries, where last time I sat on this sofa, we were talking about China, and uh, you were asking me whether it was, uh, China was a friend or foe. Electric vehicles, the supply chains for those rely on uh, Chinese batteries mostly. We have to think about that. We need to make sure that what we're doing is right for the UK. This is not uh, some, sort of cynical, uh, some sort of cynical ploy. I've been the business secretary now for almost a year. I know what businesses are saying. This is not just about big business. There's small business to think about. This is the right thing to do, and I fully support the Prime Minister. You, you mentioned the last time we sat here. It was nine days ago. Mm -hmm. You were off to Cowley to launch the, the, the Mini's new EV plan. Mm -hmm. Did you know then that the government was going to row back on these pledges? Well, I had been making uh, representations to the Prime Minister. He had not made uh, his decision uh, known to all of us, but these were, these were conversations that we were having. So I'm quite pleased that, um, that this has happened. Well, joining me now is Daisy Powell Chandler, Head of Energy and Environment at Public First, a polling company. And you've done this new polling which, which has looked at the public's reaction to what Rishi Sunak has announced. What has it told you? Yeah, so it's, it's quite timely. We ran this a couple of weeks ago and we asked people, how would you feel about a party that downgraded its net zero uh, response? And the public aren't very keen on that, including Conservative and Labour swing voters. Most people think that the government should be doing more rather than less to reach net zero. So about 
three times more people think the government should be doing more on the environment than think they should be doing less. And there's an extraordinary consensus right across the age range, for example. And climate change these days is amongst people's tier one concerns. It's just below things like the NHS, but it's still up there in the top five on most trackers. But in terms of, you, you say it's across the board, I mean, the, the, you know, the logic is that, that younger people, in theory, care more about the environment and that perhaps older voters maybe less so, and maybe this is who Rishi Sunak is trying to appeal to here, but you're saying that it's actually across the board. Yes, that's not what the polls show. These days, concern about net zero, concern about the environment more broadly, sits right across the age range. One of the only age distinctions we see is that young people are slightly more likely to say that they think there'll be a financial benefit, an economic benefit from moving towards net zero than older people. But in general, they're just as likely to think it's important. But there's a difference, isn't there, between supporting positive changes for the environment um, and having somebody come along and say, you know, we're going to take your boiler off you and it's going to cost you 10 grand. I mean, in, in terms of what people are willing to spend to, to make their ideology happen, it, it's different, isn't it? That's true. There's two points I'd make here. That's true about all policy areas. For example, I've done a lot of polling on the NHS. Everyone's very pro the NHS. Everyone's very pro more money for the NHS. When you ask people how much tax they're prepared to pay to fund that, they're a lot less keen on it. And we see exactly the same in every policy area. People are pro the principle, but they would really rather that the politicians worked out the detail. I think on the other side, what we're seeing is a lot of policies being, we're being told, we're not going to do this. Well, a lot of these weren't realistic policies. No one was going to go into people's homes and rip out their gas boilers without asking them about it. The rules were that you were going to stop using, once your current boiler had reached the end of its useful life and you went to replace it, post-2035, there just wouldn't have been a gas boiler to replace it with. And given that there are already technological solutions on the market that could replace pretty much any gas boiler, that wasn't a big loss. So should Conservative MPs be concerned about these changes then? Because it seems like, just look at the morning papers, the broad sweep seems to be that the, the majority of the papers, which you would say would represent, you know, a large part of the public, are quite pro it. But would you say that actually this might not be a vote winner. I'm, I'm not convinced it is a vote winner. When you look at the polling, actually, the public wants to see the government doing more on this. I think they've assumed that Parliament and the press represent the public slightly more closely than they might do. In fact, the British public has an extraordinary consensus in favour of net zero and radical action to achieve it. And the only climate sceptics in the country are in Parliament. That's not true. There are loads of climate sceptics really in the country. really are. It's hard to find them on any poll. <laughs> I can find them in my family, that's for sure. <laughs> um, how concerned... Um, you know, we've talked about Conservative MPs, but, but it, you know, in, in terms of Uxbridge, has that confused the Conservative Party, do you think, a, a constituency where there was this big row about, essentially, an environmental matter, and it just seems that the voters threw that out? You know, you say there are, there are climate sceptics in Uxbridge, aren't there? Yes, I think... What we have to remember, though, is that, first of all, the ULES policy is actually about clean air. It's about making sure that people have healthy lungs and children grow up healthily in London. It's not actually a climate change policy. Yes, there was uh, a real backlash against ULES, and that's because it was a badly thought through policy. A lot of the changes that have been made to the policy since, like including scrappage, if those have been included up front, then I think people would have been a lot more pro ULES. I also think it's a really bad idea for the government to extrapolate lessons from one by-election in one very specific part of the country and say that's going to work for the rest of the country. So I think learning too many lessons from ULES is something I would caution against because, in general, as I say, the public really backs climate action. They're also very sceptical of everything politicians say at the moment. It's a really cynical undercurrent in all of the focus groups that we do. And I think the public are going to find it very hard to understand a Prime Minister who says, we're going to stick with our targets, of course we're trying to beat climate change, but we're going to cancel a load of the policies that we told you were essential to get there. And I think it's quite worrying that it undermines faith in what the public are being told about how they can contribute when the Prime Minister says, all that stuff we told you before, it wasn't true. Is there a breakdown in terms of cross-party support for, for the Prime Minister's decisions? Yes, I think one of the really interesting and positive features of the UK's climate debate has been a cross-party consensus across the mainstream parties about climate change being an important uh, problem that we all need to tackle together and uh, following the advice of the experts in how we do that. They've 
there have been some variations, but for the most part, people have agreed. And we are now seeing that breakdown. And I think it means it's going to be a bruising year for the climate change debate in British politics. And in terms of the, the Prime Minister positioning this as, as linked to cost of living as well, I mean, that is a key issue for a lot of people. Um, I mean, do you think that's the right way to position himself here? I mean, telling voters that, that their policy is going to help their cost of living is surely going to be a vote winner. You would think so, except for the polling shows fairly conclusively that no one thought climate change was contributing to the cost of living issues. When we poll on this and we give people a really long list of issues, we say, which of these do you think is most contributing to the increase in the cost of living? And climate change policies come right at the bottom, below a whole load of really obscure stuff. And we also ask them, do you think that scrapping net zero would help to reduce the cost of living? And more than half say, I don't think it would have any material impact on the cost of living. OK, fascinating stuff. Daisy Powell Chandler, Head of Energy and Environment at Public First. Thank you. Well, a change of tone now. It seems that we humans aren't the only ones that find the noise of the city overwhelming. Brazil's pied tamarind monkeys are increasingly using scent markings to communicate with each other because of the expanding Amazon city of Manaus is drowning out the calls that they make. So researchers are warning that scent marking isn't really an effective way for them to communicate over long distances, which that could then mean further threaten the already critically endangered species. So the poor monkeys can't hear each other. Sounds quite smelly. Uh, after the break, why this painting, completed in just 30 minutes, is going on sale for $10 million. Basically, I had a premature midlife crisis at the age of 21, threw everything in, my career, my house, my relationship, um, and traveled around the world until I found my destiny. And my destiny was here in Thailand in the shape of a teeny tiny baby elephant called Bunlot. Now, Bunlot was two months old when I first met him. And... Um, he unfortunately wasn't destined for this lifetime. He went through a number of accidents and actually ended up passing away in my arms. Um, and when he passed away, I made him a promise that I would continue to keep on fighting, keep on raising awareness for his species and um, fighting for the good. This um, elephant behind me here, this is Nguyen. He is in his mid to late 60s, so uh, kind of in the final chapter of life now, and he is our grandfather here. These elephants are captive, and they have always been captive. They have been brutally treated their entire lives and micromanaged to the point where when we first rescue an elephant here and we walk them out into the forest and we release them, they won't touch a single branch, pull up a single blade of grass until they're given permission to, because they're scared if they do the wrong thing, that they will get beaten, they will get punished. The goal is to show these elephants after they have lived a lifetime of torture and abuse at our hands, to apologize to them and show them that not every human being in this on this world is a bad person, you know? Some of us actually do love them, respect them, and want to give them back what should have always been theirs, and that is their freedom. We all know it's wrong to take a selfie with a tiger. We all know it's wrong to watch these baby elephants riding bicycles. We all know it's wrong to have a monkey sit on our shoulder. So, you know, I implore anybody who's thinking of traveling to Thailand in the future, when you pack your suitcase, Please don't leave your morals at home.
More now on a new report that has found that three quarters of rape victims felt that they were harmed by the way that the police investigated their cases. One said she was more afraid of the police than of being raped again. Well, Noga Offer is a leading lawyer for the Centre for Women's Justice and, and she joins me now. Um, Noga, t tell us a, a little bit more about this research. What, what were its key findings? Well, the key findings were that the actual process of going through the criminal justice system and reporting to the police is really compounding the harm of the original uh, sexual assault that survivors have experienced. What were some of the things that, that they said? What were some of the things that they, they told researchers? I think one of the most disturbing findings is that 42% of the respondents said they didn't feel the police believed them. Um, and that is so fundamental to how people are treated um, and also to how police officers go about investigating crimes if they don't start from a fundamental position that people are coming forward to tell the truth, that it's very difficult um, to report uh, sexual assaults and that actually the majority of people say the reason why they report is because they don't want it to happen to anybody else. And just looking at some of the quotes from the survivors, um, my rapist is a serving and armed police officer. He was never arrested or suspended. I'm more afraid of the police than being raped again. It saddens me that someone else went through it because the police dismissed mine so quickly. Um, and it, it is, as you say, it's, it's that feeling that, that people had that, that, one, they are being investigated themselves almost, but that they have, they have gone to the police for altruistic reasons, as you say, because they don't want a repetition. How, how frustrating is this for victims? Um, it's really frustrating because you should feel that the criminal justice um, process is there for you when you need it. Um, but we see that the way rape is investigated, very, very often the focus is on the credibility of the person who's reporting. You don't find that in any other kind um, of crime where it's the victim who feels that they are the one on trial. Um, and we've seen, um, as part of Operation Soteria, which is the Home Office funded research that uh, a project that this research is part of, um, that police are not actually focusing on investigating the suspects. So much of the focus is on investigating the victims, the survivors, um, and that is something that is really unique to rape. It doesn't happen in other offences, and, um, you know, it, there, there really needs to be a, a complete shift in mindset around that. So that is, you know, in, in a sense of failing in, in, in solving the case and, and actually finding out who the perpetrator is, but also the impact that that then has on the victims. How damaging is this, this poor response or poor treatment for the victims themselves? That's right. I mean, the, the process itself is really important. You know, maybe not every case can go to court, but if people feel they've been treated fairly, um, treated with respect, um, treated with some kindness, uh, but also fundamentally believed and the evidence they put forward is followed up, then the process itself won't be uh, as damaging. We know it's tough. But what is disturbing is that such a high proportion have said they didn't feel respected or they didn't feel believed or that all the evidence wasn't followed up, um, you know, that the two things are linked, the way you go about the process and the end outcome are linked. But it's so important that people feel that going through the process isn't causing them, you know, yet more trauma. We spoke to the Home Secretary earlier this week and, and she pointed out uh, the, these new rape specialist teams that, that are being installed around the country. They're certainly not in every, any police station by any stretch of the imagination, are they? But are they making a difference? Well, we don't know yet. Um, there is this new national operating model that is being rolled out across the country and this is a huge opportunity to make a difference. Um, but the proof of the pudding, you know, will be in the eating and we'll have to see how that is actually implemented on the ground, but it is a real chance to change uh, the mindset, to start focusing on investigating suspects, investigating their previous convictions, previous allegations made against them, rather than what we see a lot of the time, kind of what suspects say, just sort of accepted at face value. Um, we just need to see that shift in mindset. I mean, do, do you think things are improving? I mean, conviction rates for rape are, are absolutely woeful, sort of 1%, 2%. I mean, do you... Do you feel any hope looking to the future? Do you think things are getting better? So there was a terrible sort of nosedive off a cliff edge um, in the number of cases charged uh, in around 2016, 2017. And, you know, through a lot of campaigning and the government looking at it, things have improved. 
they've only gone back to, you know, where they were around 2015, 2016, but it shows that things can get better if attention is put onto it, if proper resourcing is put into it, and if we sort of get away from a mindset where survivors are not being believed, where there's an assumption that, that everyone is making false allegations. You know, we need to put a concerted effort in, um, and I think there can be real improvements, and this is a real opportunity to do that. Noga offer from the lawyer uh, for the Centre for Women's Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's take a look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The unsettled conditions mean it's going to be a windy week with showers or longer spells of rain. Mostly warm and windy out there now, with heavy rain spreading eastwards across Britain. That rain will continue across England and Wales this morning, but probably won't reach the far southeast, where it'll be mainly fine. Showery conditions will follow to the northwest. Elsewhere, sunny spells and blustery showers. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, this isn't too bad for an hourly rate. A painting completed in about 30 minutes in 1983 is going on sale for almost $10 million in the US. It's called A Walk in the Woods, and it's an original by Bob Ross, the first of more than 400 he painted for his TV series. He died in 1995, but has drawn new popularity in recent years, with millions watching his old shows on YouTube. So it's a good hourly rate, but he's not getting any of the pay. Doesn't seem fair, does it? Uh, lots more to come on Sky News Breakfast. Stay with us after the break.
Hello, good morning. It's 8 o'clock. The Business Secretary told Sky News this morning that the government is listening to people's concerns about the cost of getting to net zero and denied it was a cynical ploy. We'll hear what the Labour Party thinks in a few minutes. It's Thursday, the 21st of September. I'm on Downing Street measuring the political fallout from the Prime Minister's climate climb down. But Kemi Badenoch, Business Secretary, says it's not political. We need to make sure that what we're doing is right for the UK. This is not uh, some sort of cynical, uh, some sort of cynical ploy. Rishi Sunak delayed the ban on new petrol and diesel cars and said households will never be forced to rip out their existing boilers. Also ahead, three out of four rape survivors tell a new study that they were harmed by the way the police investigated their case. Interest rates could go up again when the Bank of England meets at midday, but yesterday's fall in inflation gives hope to millions of homeowners. Hello, good morning. Rishi Sunak could have taken the biggest gamble of his career. He's provoked a tsunami of criticism from climate scientists, car makers and some Conservative MPs by dumping green policies. But he will hope that by easing the burden on hard-pressed families, he's put himself on the right side of public opinion. A fifth of all homes will be exempted from the requirement to install a heat pump if they are replacing their existing boiler after 2035. And cash grants from people who want to make the change now will increase from 5,000 to 7,500. The ban on sales of new petrol and diesel cars will be delayed from 2030 to 2035. And the requirement for privately rented homes to have an energy efficiency rating of C or better by 2028 has been abandoned. Well, not long ago, the Business Secretary, Kemi Badenoch, told me that the government has to do what is right for the UK, insisting it is not some cynical ploy. She also responded to criticism from the former Conservative Minister, Zach Goldsmith, saying most people in this country don't have his kind of money. Yeah, I know Zach Goldsmith very well. He is a friend. I fundamentally yes, disagree. Let me finish. I fundamentally disagree with what he has said. We are listening to the concerns people are raising with us. Most people in this country don't have the kind of money that he has. We have to think about what people can reasonably afford. We have people who are not connected to the gas grid, who are being made to make changes, there are people you know, who use oil tanks and so on, that are simply not feasible. We are looking at supply chain issues around batteries, where last time I sat on this sofa, we were talking about China, and uh, you were asking me whether it was, uh, China was a friend or foe. Electric vehicles, the supply chains for those rely on uh, Chinese batteries mostly. We have to think about that. We need to make sure that what we're doing is right for the UK. This is not uh, some, sort of cynical, uh, some sort of cynical ploy. I've been the business secretary now for almost a year. I know what businesses are saying. This is not just about big business. There's small business to think about. This is the right thing to do, and I fully support the Prime Minister. You, you mentioned the last time we sat here. It was nine days ago. Mm -hmm. You were off to Cowley to launch the, the, the Mini's new EV plant. Mm -hmm. Did you know then that the government was going to row back on these pledges? Well, I had been making uh, representations to the Prime Minister. He had not made uh, his decision uh, known to all of us, but these were, these were conversations that we were having. So I'm quite pleased that, um, that this has happened. Well, with me now is the Shadow Minister for Industry and Decarbonisation, uh, Sarah Jones. Uh, good to talk to you this morning. morning. Uh, the Prime Minister has made it very clear what he thinks we should be doing in order to still meet our, our net zero commitments. Let's be clear about Labour's. If, if you're elected, oh. would, would a Labour government move back the date for the banning of new petrol and diesel cars to what we thought it was until, until yesterday, 2030? Yes. Look, the Prime Minister doesn't get it. He's weak. He gives in to Liz Truss as soon as she speaks. What he doesn't get is that net zero is the biggest economic opportunity we have in the 21st century. We live in a country where we talk about former industrial heartlands. This is our chance to get rid of that label former and to bring jobs across the country and to cut bills. So Labour has a plan that will create jobs and cut bills. We're going to insulate millions of homes so we're paying less for our energy. We're going to introduce 
eight gigafactories, which will turbocharge that uh, electric vehicle industry so that we can make them here and not rely on them uh, from other countries. We're going to set up a national wealth fund which will invest alongside the private sector in all the industries that we need to see in the future. And we're going to have renewable clean energy, which will make us stop being reliant on the likes of Putin for our energy. This is our one opportunity. Rishi Sunak has blown it. The government have blown it over 13 years. They haven't invested. The car industry has dropped in terms of employment by nearly 40% since 2010. Uh, the government has failed to negotiate with Europe. So there's a cliff edge coming on the 1st of January where the car industry is facing 10% tariffs uh, on sales, which is just going to destroy our UK car industry if the government doesn't get a grip. So this is weak, it's wrong, uh, and he has really thrown uh, industry under the bus. OK, so you, you, the Labour government would go back to the 2030 uh, uh, ban on diesel and petrol cars. What about the home installation rules, the dates for replacing boilers? Would they also go back to the, to the dates that the government had set for before yesterday? But when it comes to heat pumps, um, it, the government has utterly failed to get us anywhere close to being able to meet this target. And that's just an admission of guilt. From but, but what would a Labour government the do? Would they, would they, we know would you, we would you still tell people that they had to replace their boilers with heat pumps? Not, uh, not to those timescales, no. We know that the market is just not there on heat pumps. The government have failed. You need home insulation before you put in a heat pump. Home insulation has fallen by 90% since the government got into power. Labour would insulate people's homes, which would cut those bills. There is no market for heat pumps because the government hasn't created the incentives for one. Uh, and the, the grant system for these kind of things is all over the place. You just have to speak to anybody who's tried to apply for one. So that's an admission of failure. It's their failure. Uh, they need to own it. And, and we know those targets are not going to be reached. But the, okay, the so if those targets aren't going to be reached, wasn't if those targets aren't going to be reached, wasn't, isn't the government right to announce what it's announcing? Then isn't it just being pragmatic, saying, look, these targets aren't going to be reached. The industry hasn't kept up on us. We're going to make a, a more realistic target. It's not realistic. It's just an admission of utter failure from this government to do the things they promised to do. That's all it is. Uh, and when it comes to cars and the 2030 target that we do want to uh, keep, and we do think industry need that certainty. You know, the government is claiming that this will save money for people. Where is his numbers on this? Because the vast majority of us buy secondhand cars. I've never bought a new car. And secondhand sales for uh, uh, petrol and diesel will continue beyond 2030. But what this um, abandoning of the target does is it makes us more reliant on, on oil and the global marketplace, which is all driven by what Russia and the like are doing. So it makes us more vulnerable. Um, it makes us uh, miss all the opportunities we can have to create new jobs um, and skills in our country by incentivizing and encouraging electric uh, vehicles. And it, it, it shows that the government just has no industrial plan whatsoever uh, and is happy to see decline in an industry that should be thriving, that is uh, uh, the, the automotive industry is a jewel in the crown, it's something that should be our future, not just our past. So the automotive industry over the next year will now be working to these new targets. We don't know when another election will be, but they are going to know that if they vote for a Labour government, they're going to have to move the goalposts again. That does not give any sort of stability for the motoring industry, does it? It, it suggests that if a Labour government is going to, they're going to bring a Labour government in, they're going to have to change all their rules yet again. Isn't that more uncertainty for the car market? Wouldn't you be best off just saying, we're going to stick to what Rishi Sunak has announced here to give all voters certainty? Look, what Rachel Reeves has been really clear on is that Labour will not um, do anything that damages our fiscal rules, that we will invest in a sensible way, that we will walk hand in hand with business so that we can create jobs for the future. They need certainty. We had a debate on the car industry um, just a couple of days ago, and I spoke to the umbrella bodies and uh, individual sectors for that debate. They all said, we need certainty, we need clarity. The government is flip-flopping left, right and centre. He's changed his mind now. Is he going to change it again? 
who knows? Depends what Liz Truss tells him to do. Uh, they crashed the economy last year. Business is desperate for certainty. And if you talk to the car industry, they will also say government needs to sort out this cliff edge on the 1st of January when it comes to Europe and this 10% tariff on our cars that is heading our way and that the government seems blind to. How worried are you about this affecting Labour's chances in the election? I think if you look at today's papers, The Guardian um, is the one that's only openly critical on this. The Mirror, you know, traditionally Labour supporting paper, buries this story on page eight, which seems extraordinary. It says to me that they know that there are many Labour supporters out there who may well support this, who may well think that they are not that worried about reaching net zero targets because they can't afford to get to the end of the week. Who is reading the mood of the nation better here, do you think? the Conservatives or the Labour Party? So the Conservatives caused the cost of living crisis and they have no plan to tackle it. People are worried about their bills. That is the starting point that most people are coming from now. Inflation uh, went down by a minute amount yesterday. We are facing a winter where lots of people's bills are going to go back up in terms of energy. Labour would cut those bills by, on average, £1,400 by insulating our homes and having a renewable energy drive. We would create the jobs of the future. Uh, if you look at those industries like the car industry, higher wages than the national average, good, skilled, reliable jobs. That is what people want. They want a good job and they want lower bills. And that is what Labour's plan will deliver. They know after 13 years of the Conservative government, nothing is working, our public services are crumbling, no one feels better off and we know there's no plan for government. This is desperate times for Rishi Sunak uh, to try and win an election that is running away from him already. Sarah Jones, the Shadow Minister for Industry and Decarbonisation, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Well, our political correspondent, Mario Aurora, is in Downing Street today. Uh, and, Mario, we spoke to Kemi Badenoch a short while ago, uh, a, a very uh, full-throated defence of the Prime Minister, I think it's fair to say, and his policies. But there are many within the Conservative Party who are not happy about what has happened yesterday. Yes, totally, Jane. I think you're absolutely right. Kemi Badenoch there, the business secretary, really quite actually victorious. To an extent, we know she has been raising some of these concerns with car companies in Cabinet with colleagues, worried about the impact of that 2030 ban on the car industry. And therefore, for her, to an extent, I think secretly she might be doing some victory laps behind the scenes. But also, I think what you heard from Kemi Badenoch there on the sofa with you was that kind of beginning of blue on blue rivalry. We are seeing more and more splits within the Conservative Party, within the Conservative movement when it comes to net zero and climate policy. And this really is beginning to become a bit of a wedge issue uh, for the next general election. Now, that could be useful for the Conservatives or it could potentially be a bit of a dangerous gamble if they don't take the public with them. And Mari, what did you make of, it, of the opposition's arguments that we've just heard from? Well, interestingly, I think Labour are really trying to brand this as Tory failure, Tory weakness. They are trying to say that this is a missed opportunity for green jobs, a green future. And that's the beginning, I think, of some, some level of positivity. But I think with the Labour Party, even though they are trying to show that they are very different when it comes to certain policy areas from the Conservatives and that they would do a better job, I think there still does need to be a little bit more clarity at some point, might not, maybe yes, but at some point, uh, on their kind of climate climate policies and how they're going to pay for them. But also, I think for both parties, not just the Labour Party, there needs to be more of a vision of optimism. They need to really start to paint a picture, make the public imagine what the, what the country would look like under a Labour government, and the same for the Tories. And right now, there's a lot of negativity, there's a lot of fighting, there's a lot of negative rhetoric, and I don't know if the public will end up responding to that. At some point, we're going to have to get some positive messages out there. OK, Mari, thank you very much. Well, the Prime Minister's announcement dominates the morning papers and they give us a flavour of the battle lines that are being drawn up. The Sun says Rishi Sunak has given us a break. At last, they comment in their editorial, the Tories have something to sell on the doorstep. The Mail praises the Prime Minister for taking on what it calls eco-zealots. The Express brands him Honest Rishi. And Sunak spares public net zero pain is the similarly supportive headline in The Telegraph. 
but not everybody's on side. The Times calls the decision to hit the brakes on green commitments a gamble. And The Guardian brands it a green bonfire, pointing out the furious reaction from industry and the despair of climate scientists. The FT also focuses on the backlash from business. Well, in other news, three quarters of rape and sexual assault survivors say that their mental health was harmed by the way the police investigated their case. 2,000 people were interviewed in England and Wales as part of a government-funded programme called Operation Soteria Bluestone. Well, our correspondent Rachel Venables is here in the studio with me. Uh, and Rachel, just talk us through this research. Well, the team behind this research say it is the biggest survey of its kind and I have to say the results really are damning for police forces in England and Wales because it really does highlight a series of failures from police officers uh, in this country when it comes to responding to the victims of serious sexual crimes. Victims uh, telling the survey that they weren't believed, they weren't protected, they didn't think the officers understood their needs or what they'd gone through. Countless respondents said that their rapists or their attacker went on to attack them again or other people as a direct result of the police not taking their report seriously. And one survivor staggeringly even told researchers that they were more afraid of the police than they were of being raped again. Now, I'll just run you through some of the key numbers. 75% of people who responded to this survey said their mental health worsened as a direct result of what the police did or didn't do while investigating their crime. More than half of respondents, 56%, said they would be unlikely to report a rape to police again. And only about a quarter of rape and sexual abuse survivors felt that officers really understood what it was like for them. Now, the research was led by the National Police Chiefs Council in a bid to improve the judicial process for victims of these crimes. And the research itself was led by Professor Catherine Hull at the City University of London. When investigations go poorly, the impact long term and immediately on survivors can be quite severe. Three out of four said their mental health got worse. 50% said it had impact on their physical health. 40% say they feel less safe. And we've seen in the survey evidence of survivors being unprotected and saying it's emboldened their perpetrators to carry on offending. To so there's a lot in here that is very concerning and I'm sure bosses, police bosses throughout England and Wales will be looking at this survey very closely. There were also some examples of truly brilliant police work, of survivors who said the police officers made all the difference for them, that they went above and beyond. And also, interestingly, there are signs of some hope with uh, uh, survivors and victims who reported contact with the police in the last three months, having had a significantly better experience than people previously. OK, so possibly some hope at least. Rachel, thank you. Now, it's just possible that the Bank of England will meet today and decide not to put up interest rates. And that would still surprise most economists, but the decision is looking more finely balanced after yesterday's unexpected fall in inflation. Here's our economics and data editor, Ed Conway. In the real economy, where oil, gas and fuel are still all important, the shadow of energy prices still looms large, especially in the haulage business. In the last three months, um, we've seen a huge increase um, in the region of 17.5%, which in real terms puts our bill up um, about half a million pounds a year, um, which is obviously somewhere around £10,000 a week. The rate of inflation is now coming down, but prices are still rising. I know we had good news with the inflation, but uh, figures being lower than expected. But I don't think the fuel price increases have sort of got filtered into that yet, um, which they certainly will during September. Still, there is now a glimmer of hope in the data, for not only did inflation fall to 6.7% in August, it's falling faster than expected. You get a sense of that from this chart. The bars show you how much above or below economists' expectations inflation actually came in. For most of recent history, inflation was higher than expected. Those bars were in the red territory. But now look at August, that bar on the far right. It was further below expectations than at any point in the cost of living crisis. So what does it mean in practice? Well, for one thing, that target set by the Prime Minister and Chancellor of halving inflation by the end of the year looks a bit more likely. On the other side of town, the Bank of England may be less likely to raise interest rates, although most economists think they still will do. 
But it's worth just taking a step back here. Why is inflation falling? In part, it's because people have less money to spend. That is a recessionary signal. And that signal is coming across here in the hospitality sector. I would say people are careful with money now. They know that they're under pressure and there's a, a semi-recessionary mentality without a full recession. So they are going out a bit less, spending a bit less when they're out. In short, probably a bit too early to be popping champagne corks. But with inflation now falling faster than expected, perhaps a little glass of Prosecco. Cheers. Ed Conway, Sky News. And we'll bring you live coverage of the Bank of England's interest rate decision. That is from 12 midday today here on Sky News. In an historic first, the King will address the French Senate this morning. Uh, he's already been spending quite a bit of time in France and had a dinner last night. Our correspondent, our royal correspondent, Laura Bundock, is in Paris for us. Well, it's another busy day, frankly, after all the ceremony yesterday, starting at the Arc de Triomphe and then heading to the Palace of Versailles. And I think you have to say the French really have done all they can to make the King and Queen feel welcome. It's very interesting looking at some of the French papers today. One of them describing as this visit shining a light, a soothing light to restore a damaged friendship. Others, frankly, just happy to see Mick Jagger on a red carpet at Versailles. But you're right, the engagements continue today. The King going to the Senate. He'll be the first British monarch to ever address the Senate from the floor of the the chamber there. He'll be speaking to both houses, a speech in both English and French. It'll really set the tone, I think, of this visit. Every word, every theme will have been carefully thought about. And although, of course, the government will approve what he says, I think we can expect some personal touches. He is bound to talk about his late mother and her connection with France, how much she loved France, how much she used to visit as well. I think also it'll be interesting to see how it goes down, how it was received when he gave the speech to the Bundestag in Germany back in March. It lasted 23 minutes and had a two-minute standing ovation at the end. So watch out for the reactions after his speech. After that, though, the day really continues apace. Seven more engagements from sport to a visit to see how the renovations and repairs of Notre Dame are going on after that devastating fire. So another busy day on day two of this state visit. And, of course, a couple then heading to Bordeaux tomorrow for more. Yeah. Well, King Charles is scheduled to make his historic address to the French Senate chamber at 9.40 this morning. We will bring that to you live. Iran's parliament has approved a bill to impose harsher penalties on women who refuse to wear the Islamic headscarf in public. Offenders face up to 10 years in prison and there are also tougher punishments for anyone who supports them. The change has been made just days after the anniversary of the death in custody of Massa Amini, which ignited months of anti-government protests. It's all parents no longer believe their children must attend school every day since the coronavirus pandemic. That's according to the consultancy Public First, which found parents taking their children on holiday during term time is now seen as socially acceptable. Airbnb says it's cracking down on fake listings, removing 59,000 of them so far this year. Fake listings have become a major problem for Airbnb, as it's apparently scaring off customers. The San Francisco-based company has been using artificial intelligence to crack down on fraudsters. Now, a century after oysters disappeared from the Firth of Forth near Edinburgh, they are back. A restoration project hopes to eventually reintroduce 30,000 oysters to the estuary, filtering the water and improving fish numbers and seagrass. Oysters were wiped out by overfishing and pollution. Military veterans who are involved in nuclear weapons tests are taking their fight for their medical records to the courts. They say the Ministry of Defence is withholding the records illegally, compounding the trauma and illnesses that they and their families have suffered for years. Sky correspondent Becky Cottrell reports. These men, a generation apart, both believe they've been poisoned by radiation from nuclear tests carried out by the British government. Veteran John Morris was stationed on Christmas Island in the South Pacific in the 1950s. I was there for four atomic bombs. The nearest was 20 miles away. And I had a pair of shorts, a shirt on and sunglasses. And it was like sitting in the centre of the sun. 
John developed anemia and was later diagnosed with cancer, like many others he served with. He went on to have children, but his son died when he was a baby. John believes it's all because of radiation and says his medical records from the time should show this. I know for a fact that I had urine and blood samples taken and they are not recorded, but the MOD suggests they were never taken. Steve Peirce was born with a series of disabilities. His father, David, ran an airfield in Australia where nuclear weapons tests were carried out. Steve has been trying to get hold of his dad's medical files. I had an email just this week from the RAF uh, saying, yes, the MOD search has found the information you require, but no, you can't have it. And they're quoting some law about confidentiality. What are they hiding? It's as if they know that what Dad was exposed to probably caused my condition and they just don't want me to have it. In order to find out what really happened to his father, he's launching legal action along with veterans and other relatives. In a statement, the Ministry of Defence said it remains the case that no information is withheld from veterans and any medical record taken either before, during or after participation in the UK nuclear weapons tests are held in individual military medical records in the government's archives, which can be accessed on request. But that's not the experience of those like John and David. They are demanding answers to improve their own medical care, but also to show genetic risks their loved ones might be exposed to. Becky Cottrell, Sky News. Let's go look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The unsettled conditions this week mean it'll often be windy with showers or longer spells of rain. Mostly warm and windy out there right now with heavy rain spreading eastwards across Britain. That rain will continue across England and Wales this morning but probably won't reach the far southeast where it'll be mainly fine. Showery conditions will follow to the northwest. Elsewhere, sunny spells and blustery showers, some heavy and perhaps thundery, a touch warmer overall. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. has rallied and moderation interest rates peaking and up at six percent the highest for 14 years will that be the peak will it be a little bit lower crisis it's closer to a potential crash so many words so many meanings but what do they mean for you and your finances stay up to date on sky news i'm martha kalner and i'm sky's u.s correspondent based here in los angeles it's turning everybody into you know a crazy violent drug addict <laughs> How are you feeling? You I am angry. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Gillian, you just don't cross her. You're so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous.
You're watching Sky News Breakfast, our top stories this morning. The business secretary tells Sky News that the government's U-turn on its green pledges is not a cynical ploy for votes, as the PM says poorer families shouldn't have to suffer unacceptable losses. A new study reveals three out of four rape survivors report that they were harmed by the way the police investigated their case. And economists expect another interest rate rise today by the Bank of England, but it's a finely balanced decision after yesterday's unexpected fall in inflation. Now, the United Nations has described Rohingya refugees as the most persecuted minority in the world. Almost a million people have spent years languishing in sprawling camps in Bangladesh after fleeing violence in Myanmar. Returning home simply isn't an option. War continues to rage inside Myanmar. Sky's chief correspondent Stuart Ramsey spent a month in the jungle there and explores the devastation in a new documentary. Bombing hospitals is a war crime. Yet in Myanmar, it's happening all the time. The junta targets hospitals. Well, there have been many warnings of potential attacks from the Myanmar army, but the staff didn't abandon this hospital because they said it was so obviously a hospital. Well, it was attacked. There were patients in here. You can see with the uh, missiles came through, the shrapnel came through, they had to clear people out of here. Apparently, it was a, a, a huge panic. Um, the hospital then began getting the patients out as quickly as they were able to do. They weren't sure if there were going to be follow-up strikes uh, or not. Now, what we know is that hospitals have been attacked regularly around the whole of this state. As you can see, there are still syringes inside the bottles. They were still actually treating people when it came under attack. Well, I'm joined by Nihan Erdogan, who's the Deputy Chief of Mission responsible for emergencies at the International Organization for Migration in Bangladesh. Uh, good to see you today. Thank you for coming in. So the, the crisis inside Myanmar and the fighting there is still continuing in, in, on multiple fronts in lots of places. Lots of the Rohingyas are seeking refuge at Cox's Bazaar on, on the Bangladeshi side of the border, the largest refugee camp in the world. How bad is the situation there at the minute? So we have uh, one million Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. More than half of them are children and they have been in displacement for so many years. And the conditions are worsening. They are in these highly congested and disaster prone camps. And this year has been particularly challenging. We had a fire in March where 16,000 people lost their everything within minutes. Two months later in May, cyclone, everyone was affected. Another two months in July, August, monsoon, floods, landslides, tens of thousands of people are affected. So it's not just their displacement across the board, but also within that protracted crisis, the disaster and hazards that keep hitting them every single year and really testing their resilience. Because they've lost everything by leaving their country and they're losing the, the very meagre amount of things that they have managed to retain every time there's a disaster, aren't they? What help are you able to give them? Yeah. We provide them a lot of the humanitarian assistance. What is really important to understand in the context of Rohingya crisis is that they are almost 100% dependent on humanitarian assistance. So the, the international organization provide everything from water to food to their shelter needs, to their healthcare needs and everything. But the challenge we have now, as there are so many humanitarian crises around the world, the funding is going down significantly. And that means in the everyday lives of people is that they're getting less than the minimum humanitarian assistance that they should be getting. What kind of impact does it have on their mental health, having to live like this for protracted periods of time? Huge. So soon after they came to Bangladesh in 2017, we had a mental health assessment. And we found out something very interesting. More than half of the population we surveyed, they were having what they described as an identity crisis. So it was really impacting their feelings of belonging, their feelings about preserving their culture and heritage. 
it has a huge impact, which eventually pushed us to come up with very creative and innovative ways to deal with the mental health challenge of Rohingya population. And, and what is it you do? You, 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 you're, you've created a cultural memory centre in the refugee camp. Tell me about that. What is it? Yes. It is a very uh, unique project that we have. When we found out that their, their feelings about their belonging and culture and heritage is impacting their mental health significantly, we realised that this cannot continue with your usual clinical way of you know, providing mental health. So we provided them with an opportunity to preserve their culture. And last year, we opened this cultural memory centre. We created or recreated more than 1,000 cultural objects. And this is a place where Rohingyas can safely practice their culture, both tangible and intangible, where they can just simply, you know, enjoy their music, enjoy their poems, tell their stories, have their tapestries, whatever it is that makes them themselves. Do you think, do you have any hope, and I suppose do they have any hope, that they will be able to, to one day move back to, to Myanmar and to go back to their villages and towns? I think that's the magic word that you use, hope. They really need to have that hope, and we all have the responsibility to give them that hope that one day the conditions will be there so that they can return. And until that day, it is also our responsibility for all of us to make sure that we continue providing them the minimum conditions they need. We continue giving them the funding they need so that the day they go back their home, they're ready to reintegrate to their societies. I mean, the problem is that when uh, something like this happens and a humanitarian situation happens like, like it did, the, the world's media focuses on it. Uh, we've gone back there now to make this documentary, but as time passes and as, as it just becomes the norm that these people are now living in Bangladesh, do you fear that, that international support, international interest in their story will fade? That's a very important point. We need to make sure that the Rohingya crisis, it does not turn into a forgotten crisis. That's the key message we have. Because I want to repeat what I said. It's important to understand that these people are almost 100% dependent on humanitarian assistance. That's why we should not be forgetting this stateless refugee population. Mm. Really interesting to talk to you. Uh, Nihan Erdogan uh, from uh, IOM in ba Bangladesh. Good to talk to you. Thank you for coming in. Well, Stuart's documentary, The Last Hospital, 30 Days in Myanmar, uh, airs from tonight on Sky News at 9 o'clock. So tune in to that if you can. The Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, is to meet the US President Joe Biden in Washington today. The visit comes as Congress is debating a proposal from the White House to provide as much as $24 billion in military and humanitarian aid for Ukraine. Our US correspondent, Mark Stone, has more. Yes, a critical day ahead for the Ukrainian president. Zelensky will need his trademark presence, his poise and his powers of persuasion to drive home to American politicians why this fight is theirs too. Do not abandon us now will be his message. He'll meet President Biden at the White House, of course. He'll visit military leaders at the Pentagon. But I think the crux of this visit will be Capitol Hill, where he will find an influential number of doubting politicians who could block the ongoing American funding for the war. You know, I think it is a sign of the times that the weakest link in the Western alliance against Russian aggression right now seems to be America's Republican Party. While an old guard of Republicans do still inhabit the corridors of the Senate, over in the House of Representatives, where the majority are Republican, there is an air of American first isolationism. Trumpian politicians are threatening to force a government shutdown if their deep opposition to Ukrainian funding and other issues are not addressed. They say America is writing blank checks to Ukraine. In fact, the war is costing each American the equivalent of about 50p a day. Zelensky will try to persuade them that it is their war too, that his counteroffensive is working, that Putin will lose, but only if they back him. Mark Stone there. Now, a slight change of tone. It seems that we humans aren't the only ones that may find city noise overwhelming sometimes. Brazil's pied tamarind monkeys are increasingly starting to use scent markings to communicate with each other. I'll, I'll let you visualise what that means. Uh, because the expanding Amazon city of Manaus, 
the noise from it is drowning out the calls that they normally make to each other. Uh, but researchers are warning that these scent markings uh, isn't the most effective way for them to communicate over long distances because, of course, you, they can hear uh, further than they can smell. And they are worried that this could further threaten this already critically endangered species. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. Coming up after the break, we'll meet the 23-year-old running marathons in some of the most remote and difficult parts of the world for a very good cause. Basically, I had a premature midlife crisis at the age of 21, threw everything in, my career, my house, my relationship, um, and traveled around the world until I found my destiny. And my destiny was here in Thailand in the shape of a teeny tiny baby elephant called Bunlot. Now, Bunlot was two months old when I first met him. And... Um, he unfortunately wasn't destined for this lifetime. He went through a number of accidents and actually ended up passing away in my arms. Um, and when he passed away, I made him a promise that I would continue to keep on fighting, keep on raising awareness for his species and um, fighting for the good. This um, elephant behind me here, this is Nguyen. He is in his mid to late 60s, so uh, kind of in the final chapter of life now, and he is our grandfather here. These elephants are captive, and they have always been captive. They have been brutally treated their entire lives and micromanaged to the point where when we first rescue an elephant here and we walk them out into the forest and we release them, they won't touch a single branch, pull up a single blade of grass until they're given permission to, because they're scared if they do the wrong thing, that they will get beaten, they will get punished. The goal is to show these elephants after they have lived a lifetime of torture and abuse at our hands, to apologize to them and show them that not every human being in this on this world is a bad person, you know? Some of us actually do love them, respect them, and want to give them back what should have always been theirs, and that is their freedom. We all know it's wrong to take a selfie with a tiger. We all know it's wrong to watch these baby elephants riding bicycles. We all know it's wrong to have a monkey sit on our shoulder. So, you know, I implore anybody who's thinking of traveling to Thailand in the future, when you pack your suitcase, Please don't leave your morals at home. Watching Sky News Breakfast, Rishi Sunak's decision to put the brakes on some environmental policies has drawn sharp criticism from climate scientists, industry and some conservative critics. Former Minister Zach Goldsmith accused the government of turning its back on the world and on future generations. Well, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson echoed some of the criticism we've heard from car manufacturers. He said it's crucial that those we give businesses confidence that the government is still committed to net zero and can see the way ahead. We cannot afford to falter now or in any way lose our ambition for this country. Rishi Sunak insists that the UK government is still committed to reaching its net zero targets and that his proposals will help ensure public support. We are forecast and we have committed to reduce our carbon emissions by 2030 by 68%. There is no other advanced economy in the world who comes close to that kind of commitment. That's the commitment that we're sticking to today. It's a commitment that we're confident we can deliver. Just to give you a sense, what's, we're at 68%. Where's the EU? 55%. Australia, 45. America, Japan, 40. Canada, 20. New Zealand, 18. 
Well, Sky's People and Politics correspondent Nick Martin's been to Morley and Outwood, the constituency of Conservative MP Andrea Jenkins, who told Sky News that people there don't buy into net zero policies. Let's find out if she's right. So this is my uh, combination boiler. Gordon is into his green technology like solar power, but he says he's not ready to give up his gas boiler just yet. He also happens to have been a plumber for 25 years. These are the go-to boiler for oh, yeah. millions of people, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, And the government, the government's plan was to phase these out. What was the problem with that and the time scale, do you think? I think the, the problem that they've always had is that it was an unrealistic target. And it sounds great, but it's impractical. Getting the UK to net zero will require huge changes to how we all live. The Prime Minister says households who will struggle to make the switch will be exempt from replacing boilers for heat pumps. That's a crucial sweetener for a fifth of households who, with this change, won't need expensive upgrades. Ultimately, international agreements on climate change were always perhaps going to be balanced with the needs of real people and what they can actually afford. The Prime Minister now calculating that going too fast could serve to alienate struggling voters in constituencies like this one. There are now more than 800,000 electric cars in Britain. Sales have boomed since the government committed to ban the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030. It looks like motorists will now have another five years to hit that expensive target. Personally, I believe it does need to be pushed further into the future. Um, so the government have got time to put the infrastructure into place because there isn't enough fast chargers when people are out on the road on a daily basis. This sort of policy doesn't surprise me and I feel like it's definitely done as a, as a vote winner um, rather than um, done with good conscience um, and it's quite symptomatic of constantly changing cabinet and changing prime ministers. This surprise announcement by the government is certainly a major policy U-turn, but in the eyes of voters, it could recharge the government's flagging popularity. Nick Martin, Sky News, Leeds. Well, one person who is absolutely convinced the Prime Minister is doing the right thing is his business secretary, Kemi Badenoch. We gave you another chance to see our interview with her at the top of the next hour, but here's a flavour of what she had to say. Yeah, I know Zach Goldsmith very well. He is a friend. I fundamentally yes, disagree. Let me finish. I fundamentally disagree with what he has said. We are listening to the concerns people are raising with us. Most people in this country don't have the kind of money that he has. We have to think about what people can reasonably afford. We have people who are not connected to the gas grid, who are being made to make changes, uh, people you know, who use oil tanks and so on, that are simply not feasible. We are looking at supply chain issues around batteries, where last time I sat on this sofa, we were talking about China, and uh, you were asking me whether it was, uh, China was a friend or foe. Electric vehicles, the supply chains for those rely on uh, Chinese batteries mostly. We have to think about that. We need to make sure that what we're doing is right for the UK. This is not uh, some, sort of cynical, uh, some sort of cynical ploy. I've been the business secretary now for almost a year. I know what businesses are saying. This is not just about big business. There's small business to think about. This is the right thing to do, and I fully support the Prime Minister. You, you mentioned the last time we sat here. It was nine days ago. Mm -hmm. You were off to Cowley to launch the, the, the Mini's new EV plant. Mm -hmm. Did you know then that the government was going to row back on these pledges? Well, I had been making uh, representations to the Prime Minister. He had not made uh, his decision uh, known to all of us, but these were, these were conversations that we were having. So I'm quite pleased that, um, that this has happened. Now, running a marathon, I think we can all agree, is hard enough. Well, that's if you could even get off the sofa to even start to train for one. But how about running seven of them in some of the most unforgiving corners of the world, including the Arctic Circle? Well, 23-year-old Louis Alexander is doing that, and his motivation is raising money to try to beat Alzheimer's disease for a very personal 
reason. And Louis joins me now. Uh, Louis, so uh, well done. Tell us a little Thank bit you. more about this challenge that, you, that you're taking on. Where are you going to be running? Sure. So I'm currently taking on a global challenge for a global cause. And I'm currently running seven marathons, as you said, through the most remote corners of all seven continents. So, so far, I've ran through the desert in Africa, through a desert in Asia, I've ran through Alaska in North America, and I've also ran through the Australian outback for the Oceania chapter. And I'm now approaching, approaching a really exciting time with three months of three back-to-back -back expeditions through the Amazon jungle in October, Arctic Circle in November, and Antarctica in December. So running in all those different climatic zones, that mm. must be really challenging. You know, your training to run in a really hot country must be different, presumably, to your training to run in a really cold environment. Absolutely. You know, where I started this project was in the desert in Africa. Temperatures were close to 40 degrees, which, as a redhead, you can imagine, has its own challenges. Uh, and, I'll <laughs> and we'll conclude this project in Antarctica, where temperatures will be as low as minus 25. So there's a huge contrast. And as you said, these are not normal conditions. These are abnormal conditions, and therefore my training can't be normal either, so I'm often preparing in uh, hot chambers, cold chambers, doing everything I can to prepare myself as best as possible. Now, you're running to try to raise awareness uh, and money for Alzheimer's research. Why is that? Sure. So my grandfather, Captain Rick Taylor, he served in the British Army for 38 years. He served all around the world, but it was sadly his battle against dementia which took his life. And I had the huge, huge honour at his funeral of delivering his eulogy. And, and there I made a promise, a promise to support the fight against dementia uh, until we find a cure. And, as my challenges grow, so must my purpose. So today I'm publishing an open letter to the Prime Minister. You brought your letter along with it. Yeah, what, <laughs> have, what yeah. are you saying in there? Just briefly summarise what you're saying sure. to the Prime Minister. Sure. So today I'm asking for a £16 million investment into improving diagnostics. So currently in, the dementia, currently in England, one in three people with dementia are never formally diagnosed, which is incredibly sad. And it means when these new potentially life-changing treatments do become available, thousands of people are going to be missing out on drugs um, that they deserve and they won't be able to get access to because of inadequate diagnosis. Because, of course, catching it early, and there's been so many advances recently, hasn't there, in medicine, can, can really make a difference. Absolutely. There's been so many, and it's given, inspiring hope in so many millions of us around the country. But the sad fact is, without people being able to get diagnosed accurately and early, then the treatments won't have its full effect. And, and in terms of what you're taking on, these are, these are big challenges, aren't they? What's, what's been the hardest part of, of all the training that you've been doing so far? Through all the training, it's the consistency. It's turning up every day. It's the consistency of, of, of remembering why you're doing this. And for me, I've got many whys now. I've got many purposes, so that, that's quite an easy thing for me now. I mean, obviously, the Prime Minister's quite busy the last 24 hours. Absolutely. Lots of big news stories. Absolutely. I mean, do you think that there is much appetite to listen in, in government at the moment. Do you think people are listening to you? I hope so. Dementia is the biggest killer in the UK. Currently, one in four beds, hospital beds, are occupied by dementia patients. So uh, I hope so. And I hope doing this, this challenge, you know, as you said, running all around the world, I hope we can potentially bring a little bit of spotlight back to why why this is so important. And talking about those beds being used, I mean, mm. that, that's key, isn't it? Because it has a massive impact on social care, doesn't it? Absolutely. The, the cost currently on informal and social care is 22.7 billion in this country. Yeah. Uh, why do a challenge like this? I mean, lots of people, you know, they, they have a cause that's dear to their heart, sure. but they don't think I'm going to run marathons, <laughs> you know, in, in, in the most far-flung corners of the world. Why did you choose this to do? Because you've confessed that actually you find running really hard. Absolutely. I still find running really hard. You know, humbling is the most... Uh, Running is the most humbling sport out there, and I've been very lucky. I'm 23 now, but I went full-time with these adventures at 22. You know, it's the greatest privilege, in my opinion, on earth to find what you love and then to be able to do it full-time, thanks to my wonderful sponsors. So uh, I've been very, very lucky. And last year, I ran 17 marathons in 17 days back-to-back. -back. In one of those 17 years, my granddad lived with dementia. I've climbed a few mountains, I've swam a few oceans, I've done a few things, but now it's time to take on the pinnacle of running, which is to run all seven continents. And are you going to keep campaigning for, for Alzheimer's research? I mean, is this a, a lifetime for you now? Absolutely. I made the promise at my granddad's funeral now four years ago, and I'll continue to fight for this the rest of my life. Well, best of luck to you, Louis. Um, it's quite a challenge, it's fair to say, <laughs> and uh, I hope you get a response from your letter as well, even though the Prime Minister is quite busy. Thanks very much, Louis Thank Alexander. Thank you very much. Well, let's take a look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Low pressure to the north of the UK will track slowly eastwards over the next few days, taking its feed of showers with it. Saturday looks like being a quiet, if rather cloudy day, but a new storm system moves in for Sunday.
There'll be a good deal of fine weather to start the day, but it is chilly with temperatures in single figures for many of us. There are a few showers along southern and western coasts, while western Scotland and Northern Ireland are cloudy and windy with some longer spells of rain. Showers more widespread through the day. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, Rishi Sunak's uh, pledges about the environment yesterday are dominating all the newspapers this morning. Let's talk to our political correspondent, Mari Aurora. Uh, there's a real uh, divergence of opinion, isn't there, between the Conservatives and the Labour Party and, of course, the Green parties on this, but also within the Conservative Party itself. Yes, absolutely, Jane. I think splits are beginning to show more and more in the Conservative Party when it comes to this net zero pledge. But also, we know the Labour Party are trying to really brand this as weakness from uh, the Rishi Sunak himself, saying that flip-flopping is not helping industry, not helping business. And they are trying to say that essentially it's not responsible of the Prime Minister to continue to change deadlines and essentially pull the rug from under businesses. So we saw there Sarah Jones speaking to you on the sofa and she was very much trying to say that actually there needs to be strategy, there needs to be certainty for business and actually it's all about fiscal responsibility. The Labour Party very much trying to show that they can be fiscally responsible if they were elected at a general election. OK, Mari, more from you uh, after the break. Thanks very much. Coming up on Sky News Breakfast, we will get more on the latest reaction to the government's shift about net zero after the business secretary told us it is not a ploy for votes. We've got reaction from the Labour Party as well. We are going to be talking to lots more people coming up in the next hour here on Sky News Breakfast. Don't go away.
Hello, good morning. It's nine o'clock. The business secretary tells Sky News this morning that the government is listening to people's concerns about the cost of getting to net zero and denied it was a cynical political ploy. Labour says the Conservatives are throwing away the biggest business opportunity of the century. It's Thursday, the 21st of September. The government's move on net zero shattered a consensus across all political parties and successive governments on how to tackle climate change. We need to make sure that what we're doing is right for the UK. This is not uh, some sort of cynical, uh, some sort of cynical flaw. Rishi Sunak delayed the ban on new petrol and diesel cars and said households will never be forced to rip out their existing boilers. Also ahead. Three out of four rape survivors tell a new study they were harmed by the way the police investigated their case. Interest rates could go up again when the Bank of England meets at midday, but yesterday's fall in inflation gives hope to millions of homeowners. And a toast to the Entente Cordiale. The stars turn out for the king at a Versailles banquet. Good morning, thanks for joining us. Rishi Sunak could have taken the biggest gamble of his career. He's provoked a tsunami of criticism from climate scientists, car makers and some conservative critics by dumping green policies. But he will hope that by easing the burden on hard-pressed families, he's put himself on the right side of public opinion. Well, a fifth of all homes will be exempted from the requirement to install a heat pump if they're replacing their existing boiler after 2035. Cash grants from people who want to make the change now will increase from five to seven and a half thousand pounds. The ban on sales of new petrol and diesel cars will be delayed from 2030 to 2035. And the requirement for privately rented homes to have an energy efficiency rating of C or better by 2028 has been abandoned. Earlier in the programme, I spoke to the business secretary, Kemi Badnock. I asked her if the prime minister was prepared to let the planet burn just to get votes from elderly car owners? Absolutely not. And that's certainly not what the announcement yesterday was about. This was about making sure that our transition to net zero is done in a fair and proportionate way. It needs to be something that is affordable. Otherwise, we won't have the consent of the British public to do the right thing. That's not what former Tory MP Zach Goldsmith says. He says this is cynical beyond belief. The Prime Minister is pretending to halt frightening proposals that simply do not exist. He's doing it to turn the environment into a US-style political wedge issue, something the UK has avoided all my political life. Sunak is chucking the environment into a political fire purely to score points. It is reprehensible. That's from, from a Conservative. Yeah, yeah, I know Zach Goldsmith very well. He is a friend. I fundamentally disagree. Let me finish. I fundamentally disagree with what he has said. We are listening to the concerns people are raising with us. Most people in this country don't have the kind of money that he has. We have to think about what people can reasonably afford. We have people who are not connected to the gas grid, who are being made to make changes, uh, people you know, who use oil tanks and so on, that are simply not feasible. We are looking at supply chain issues around batteries, where last time I sat on this sofa, we were talking about China, and uh, you were asking me whether it was, uh, China was a friend or foe. Electric vehicles, the supply chains for those rely on uh, Chinese batteries mostly. We have to think about that. We need to make sure that what we're doing is right for the UK. This is not uh, some sort of cynical, uh, some sort of cynical ploy. I've been the business secretary now for almost a year. I know what businesses are saying. This is not just about big business. There's small business to think about. This is the right thing to do, and I fully support the Prime Minister. You, you mentioned the last time we sat here. It was nine days ago. Mm -hmm. You were off to Cowley to launch the, the, the Mini's new EV plan. Mm -hmm. Did you know then that the government was going to row back on these pledges? Well, I had been making uh, representations to the Prime Minister. He had not made uh, his decision uh, known to all of us, but these were, these were conversations that we were having. So I'm quite pleased that, um, that this has happened. But that was on Monday. On Friday, I had another big announcement where we are, we're saving Port Talbot, the Tartar Steel Plant, 
at a cost of £500 million. That's the single biggest carbon emitter in the UK. So it is wrong to say that we're not serious about net zero when we're spending quite a lot of money making serious decisions like that, which don't just help save the planet, but also save jobs and help to regenerate entire areas. But it's massive mixed messages to business, isn't it? And Ford reaction yesterday, our business needs three things from the UK government, ambition, commitment and consistency. Mm -hmm. And a relaxation of these rules undermines all three. Mm -hmm. This Conservative government is undermining business, no, according to no, one big not. business, Ford. Uh, first of all, Ford made that statement without even hearing what the announcement was. So this is what happens when people respond to social media speculation rather than listening to what the government is actually they saying. Haven't they haven't changed their views they since haven't, the but, statement. But other, but other car companies have come out and said something different. Toyota, for example. And what I would say, without naming any further companies, is that businesses tell government a lot more than what you might uh, see in a corporate press release about the challenges which they are facing. And we take all of that into account when we make our decisions. But in terms of, of the goalposts that have now changed, that has changed, the date of 2030 to 2035 for the, the banning of, of new uh, diesel and petrol cars. Mm. But the staging posts on the way, for example, in this January coming up, 22% mm. of, of these cars that have mm. to be produced have to be electric. Yeah. Those aren't changing yet. So you can see where business is coming from, that they are getting mixed messages from the government and no stability. No, no, not, not at all. In fact, what that does is give them the certainty and the consistency, which they're talking about, in the near term, while providing flexibilities for people in the longer term. This is the right balance to strike, and I think it's the right thing to do. What we have said is that at 2030, there won't be a complete ban on um, uh, in, uh, uh, ICE vehicles, the petrol and diesel engines. But we expect that by then, with the uh, mandates which we're putting in place, we would have got to about 80% of electric vehicles in the populace, but doing it in a way that people can manage. That's the right thing to do. OK, that's, the, that's one car industry that's commented on. E.ON, let's talk about them. They don't believe it makes economic sense either. Chris Norbury, the chief executive, says that, that Rishi Sunak's plans are condemning people to many more years of living in drafty homes that are expensive to heat in cities clogged with dirty air from fossil fuels, missing out on the economic regeneration that this ambition brings. I mean, do you think that this really makes economic sense if we, if we step aside from, from whether or not it's the right thing to do for the environment? Yes, yes, I do. And I think what I would say to the CEO of Eon is to actually look at what the Prime Minister has announced. Some of the plans we put in place were asking people to make changes that physically could not be done to the homes that they were living in. You can't put a heat bump yeah, uh, you can't put a heat pump in certain types of property. It doesn't necessarily work uh, in cities where you have um, high-rise buildings. We need to make sure that we're doing things that are sensible and actually achievable. We still have the commitment. We still have the commitment to uh, help reduce uh, carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. So the commitment hasn't changed, but we're now doing it in a way that is honest with the public about what the costs are and making sure that people can pay for what it is that we're asking them to do. But these changes, they don't really help the poorest in society, a lot of people would argue. The poorest in society aren't fretting about when they're going to replace their car with an electric car because the poorest in society don't drive in this country. I think, the poorest I think, in I think society I'm, are not I'm, worried about I'm, installing I'm a heat I'm so pump. sorry, but that is a ludicrous statement. If you step outside of London, come to my constituency, you will find the poorest in society drive because they live in a rural area. That, These but, rules... No, 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 no. What you said is actually quite astonishing. It is not These, astonishing. It is a third astonishing. of the country doesn't what drive. You, what, what, the, the third of the country of, doesn't people who cars. live in cities, People who live in cities will be able to deal with this in a way that is quite different from people who live in towns and rural areas. We need to think about everybody, not just the metropolitan bubble. There are poor people bubble. that live in, ci yes, in, there are. in cities across the country. This is nothing to do with an urban bubble yes, and yes, metropolitan it, 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 London. I'm afraid, I'm I live afraid, in the countryside and just, I come from Newcastle. Well, I'm afraid, that my, constituents, I'm afraid that my constituents raise these concerns all the time and those who are least able to afford it are the ones who are making the most complaints. And we as a government are thinking about them. So I completely disagree with that assertion. What about those who are poor and living in rented homes in cities or in the countryside who are now not going to get their heating upgraded by their landlord because of this? That is not that is not what the policy is. We haven't said that there should be no heating upgrades. What we have said is that people won't be forced to change the type of boiler that they have before a certain date. They will still have those. And in fact, what this is doing is making it easier for them because they won't necessarily have to take a more expensive option that might actually be less practical. That is the right thing to do for those rented, uh, those, those people in rented properties. 
I put to you criticism from some elements of business, criticism from some politicians, mm -hmm. criticism from the international community. Mm -hmm. Al Gore said yesterday, the Prime Minister is wrong. We are meant to be world leaders, or at least aspire to be. Why does the Prime Minister seem to think that simply bringing the UK into line with some countries is better than punching above our weight? We have to do what is right for the UK. Al Gore is not a politician in the UK. Rishi Sunak is the Prime Minister of the UK. I've told you that we, as a government, have looked at this very carefully. We haven't rushed to these announcements. It's not because of any political ploy or any by-election. We've been looking at the numbers. We've been looking at the dates. We've been looking at the macro environment. You look at what's happening with energy costs, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, an electric vehicle uh, is not quite as cheap as it used to be to run. We've been looking at all sorts of things to make sure that what we're asking people to do is something that they can practically do. That's the, that's the right thing. The Prime Minister has made the right decision. Well, our political correspondent, Mari Aurora, is in Downing Street now. And, and Mari, criticism from lots of different sectors there being put to the business secretary, but she's confident that it is the right decision that this prime minister has made. And I suppose if you, if you look at a lot of the front pages today, a lot, a lot of those seem broadly supportive of what he's suggesting. Yeah, so far, most front pages, as you say, relatively supportive of this kind of climate climb down. And we know there has been a bit of slap polling that's been done by YouGov that seems to suggest that maybe public support is with Rishi Sunak on this. But I think it is still very much too early to tell. I think we'll have to wait and see more kind of long term what the fallout is. It's also important to remember the backstory of this. So we know the Prime Minister, the Conservative Party are almost 20 points behind behind in the polls. They are stressed about that realistically. They are going to be anxious about that and they need to start making some big uh, kind of momentous decisions to try and show how they differ from the Labour Party and how their vision would be very different from a Labour vision. The only issue is we know that Kemi Badenoch said to you on that sofa this morning, it's not about a by-election, this is not about politics. Well, realistically, we know this is all about politics. Uh, I think any Tory MP would be very sceptical of those sorts of comments. And I think a lot of Tory MPs do feel that actually this is about that Uxbridge by-election regarding the ULEs and they felt that that actually to an extent has influenced some of this go uh, government climb down. But also, what was really interesting was Kemi Badenoch there was talking about Zach Goldsmith, who's been a very vocal critic of this new policy, saying, you know, most people don't have as much money as he does and therefore he can't really talk. And it was a little bit of an, a dangerous attack line because we know that the Labour Party in the past has used that attack line against the Prime Minister, who Kemi Badenoch is trying to defend. So I think that's a slightly dangerous road to go down for the Business Secretary, but very much she was obviously very pleased with this announcement. We know she's been uh, kind of behind the scenes raising the concerns of car industry uh, dis uh, discussions uh, around the fact that they are so concerned about electric vehicle uh, ban. And the Labour Party, Sarah Jones, has been speaking to you on the sofa, and she's really talking about how this is potentially missed opportunity when it comes to green jobs in a green economy. What he doesn't get is that net zero is the biggest economic opportunity we have in the 21st century. We live in a country where we talk about former industrial heartlands. This is our chance to get rid of that label former and to bring jobs across the country and to cut bills. Labour's Sarah Jones there basically trying to say that the Tories have missed a trick and that they will regret this in the future. But also the Labour Party are really trying to stress that they would never implement any policy, any climate change or energy policy that didn't fit in to their fiscal rules because they are still very desperately trying to make sure that they maintain that very newly kind of created reputation for financial and economic competency. They want the public to trust them on the finances and that includes any other policy areas that they can ever think of or think to try and legislate for. So Labour trying to be quite careful when it comes to this and also try not to be drawn into a fight and let this kind of economic uh, connection with the climate become a wedge issue in the general election. Mari, thanks very much.
Well, joining me now is Chris Stark, Chief Executive of the UK Climate Change Committee. Um, so in, in terms of what you heard from the Prime Minister yesterday, some of the things that, that he's talked about, uh, the ban on, on petrol and diesel cars moving from 2030 to 2035, how will this affect our, our aim of getting to the net zero targets? Well, let's count the things that he talked about yesterday. There were a couple of positives in this. I mean, one, one of the most important things he talked about yesterday, I was pleased to hear it, is that he's going to try and accelerate how quickly we put grid in place in this country, which will accelerate the renewables transition in, in due course. But mostly what he said yesterday was he was going to soften some of the commitments that would bring down UK emissions. And I think you know, when we look at it, we're going to have to do the proper analysis of what was announced yesterday. But it, it didn't fill me with confidence that we're going to be able to go faster on this transition towards net zero. And that really does matter because yesterday we heard a lot about net zero by 2050. And that's a very important goal, of course. But actually more important for the climate is to get to the targets that were set uh, for 2030, uh, which were offered to the world at the uh, COP26 climate summit that we hosted in Glasgow. Today, I heard the Prime Minister very clearly recommit to those 2030 targets. They are the targets I'm most worried about. We're, we're, we're quite substantially off track for where we need to be by 2030. What the Prime Minister announced yesterday is unlikely to address that. But will the, fact, will the things he announced, will they stop us getting to our targets for 2030? Because I suppose uh, your critics or, or, or critics of these environmental plans will say, well, hang on, if we can still get to 2030, but, but still delay the ban on cars, for example, then the Prime Minister's right that, that these proposals were too onerous on British people in the first place, if it's still possible for us to get to that point without doing them. Is it possible for us to get to that point without well, doing them? Well, I, I don't know if it's going to be possible. But so what I look for is confident policy making that would tell me how to get to those goals in 2030. Now, I suppose there is a, a scenario where the Prime Minister is correct and when we get to 2030 and there is some, you know, a remarkable transition that takes place over the next seven years to get us to that, to that uh, target in 2030. But when we do our work, Every year we give an assessment of the progress the country is making. We did that last in June. Uh, we did a really interesting piece of work, just looking at the pace of the transition, the pace of decarbonisation that we've seen in the UK economy uh, over the recent period, and asking ourselves the question, how much quicker do we need to go to hit to that 2030 goal? We need to quadruple the pace, quadruple the pace of decarbonising the economy outside of the power sector where the UK has been doing things. Uh, and, uh, and what was announced yesterday is not the kind of policy package that would deliver that. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm worried about that because that we're running out of time, actually, to get to those 2030 goals. But, as you say, the Prime Minister's uh, announcement about improving the grid, is it the case that, actually, if the government were to make more big strategic decisions, that could hasten our ability to get to 2030 far better than it could be for people, you know, having this much derided seven bins for recycling? Yes, absolutely. So I think that that's the kind of confident policy making I'm talking about. We need strategic policies uh, for the country that keep us on track. And this is the point of the 2030 goal. Uh, the 2030 goal isn't net zero. The 2030 goal is actually to reduce emissions by 68%. And why does that matter? Because that determines the shape of the path that takes us all the way to net zero. There is a lot to do between now and 2030 to get the country on track for net zero by 2050. So it matters. This is really the decade where we do most of the, of the work to get the country on course for 2050. The policies that matter for that are the big anchor policies that government has to lead and government has to put in place in every sector of the economy to guide the country to the goal by 2050. It is also the case that if you put those policies in place early, if you give certainty to the private sector about what the transition itself looks like, you get a low-cost transition, you get the economic benefits that come from that, and crucially, the people in this country see quite quickly, actually, those benefits uh, in their pocket. And, and that's my worry. So when I look at what was announced yesterday, there was a sort of step back from some of those big commitments. Some of the big strategic commitments were, were in the Prime Minister's speech, probably chief among them, that switch-over date to electric vehicles. So, essentially, reading between the lines, you think it could still be possible to get to the 2030 target, but it potentially might cost us more as a result of these decisions? I think that's fair. So, I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm certainly not sitting here with you today saying that we're not going to make the 2030 goal. We want to go in and look at what was announced yesterday and make a, a better assessment of how likely it is that we'll hit that 2030 goal. But the general rule here in, in the work that we do is that the earlier you put in place your plans, the cheaper the transition, uh, the, the easier it is for the private sector res to respond and the easier it is for people in this country to know what to do as well. The longer you leave it, uh, the more rapid the transition has to be and the more that you have to throw 
effort, money at a challenge to get it to happen. So, you know, what I'm hoping is that we see a new period of politics around climate that gets us back to some of those big strategic goals and draws in, I think, the broader message that you're now seeing reported all around the world, including in New York right now, that actually this is a low-cost transition if we manage it properly. If we put out the proper strategic goals for climate change, there's a benefit to the economy, even if you don't care about climate change. OK, Chris Stark, Chief Executive of the UK Climate Change Committee. Thank you. Well, still to come on Sky News Breakfast, we're due to see something that's never happened before, a British monarch addressing the French Senate in French, we think. Uh, live coverage of King Charles's historic speech. That is coming up at 9.40. And drowned out by human noise. Find out how these critically endangered monkeys are causing a stink to communicate with each other. We arrive, a secret hospital hidden in the Myanmar jungle, treating the victims of this bloody war. This is hardcore emergency medicine in the hardest of circumstances. So you'll be doing brain surgery today? Uh, maybe. Here, the resistance lives or dies. It's been quite remarkable. You have to see these things, but it actually hurts when you do it. has rallied the moderation interest rates peaking and up at six percent the highest for 14 years will that be the peak will it be a little bit lower prices it's closer to a potential crash so many words so many meanings but what do they mean for you and your finances stay up to date on sky news i'm martha kalner and i'm sky's u.s correspondent based here in los angeles it's turning everybody into you know a crazy violent drug addict <laughs> How are you feeling? You I am angry. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to get in. You just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Welcome back. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. Now, three quarters of rape and sexual assault survivors say their mental health was harmed by the way the police investigated their case. 
2,000 people were interviewed in England and Wales as part of a government-funded programme called Operation Soteria Bluestone. Uh, this guy's Rachel Venables is here to tell us more. Uh, Rachel, what did this research find? Well, the team behind this research, which, as you mentioned, was funded by the Home Office, though entirely independent of police forces in England and Wales, say it is the biggest survey of its kind. And its findings really are damning for our police forces with the way they respond uh, to victims and survivors of serious sexual assault and rape in England and Wales. Uh, victims talking about how police officers didn't believe them, failed them by not protecting them, or just didn't understand key elements about what they'd gone through or what they needed from the police forces. Countless respondents said that their rapist went on to attack other people because the police failed to take them seriously. And staggeringly, one respondent even told this survey, this report, uh, that they were more afraid of the police now than they were of being raped again, which is just a horrifying thought. I'll run you through some of the key figures. You've already mentioned that top line. 75% uh, of respondents said that their mental health worsened as a direct result of what the police did or didn't do while investigating their crime. More than half of respondents, 56%, said they'd be unlikely now to report a rape to police again. And only about a quarter of rape and sexual abuse survivors felt that officers actually understood what it was like for them. And going through the research as well, as I've been doing this morning, there are some really key failings that I think indicate a lack of training, a lack of understanding from police forces. For example, many respondents talked about how police officers didn't understand um, about the ramifications almost, the reality of rape and sexual assault within marriage and long-term relationships. Also, 27 respondents said that their rape rapist or their assailant was a serving police officer, with one person claiming that when they went to report a sexual assault, they were then horrifyingly raped by the investigating officer. So you can see here some horrifying examples, even though in and amongst it there were some stories of brilliant police work. The report was led and written by Professor Catherine Hull, who's from City University, and she talked about the impact all this can have on victims. When investigations go poorly, the impact long-term and immediately on survivors can be quite severe. Three out of four said their mental health got worse. 50% said it had impact on their physical health. 40% say they feel less safe. And we've seen in the survey evidence of survivors being unprotected and saying it's emboldened their perpetrators to carry on offending to now, there were some signs of hope as well in all of this. Really interestingly, respondents who'd only come forward to the police in the last three months or even the last six months had a better experience. We don't know if that's because research like this, you know, innovations that the National Police Chiefs Council are putting in and police forces around the com country, whether they are having an impact. It might also just be on the reverse side that people are happier with the results that they get from the police earlier on in an investigation. And it's only at the end when perhaps there hasn't been an adequate conclusion that they feel this negative about it. OK, Rachel, thanks very much. Now, it's just possible that the Bank of England will meet today and decide not to put up interest rates. That would still surprise most economists, but the decision is looking much more finely balanced after yesterday's unexpected fall in inflation. Sky's business presenter Ian King joins us now to read the runes from the city. Ian, what's your money on? Well, Jane, it is an absolute coin toss, I think, following yesterday's inflation data. The market had been looking for an inflation figure for August of 7.1%. In the event, uh, we got 6.7%. That was down from 6.8% in July. But it was also some of the other uh, commentary that came around that, some of the other cuts of uh, data that we got. For example, core inflation, which is a key measure that strips out volatile elements such as food, drink, alcohol, tobacco and energy. Uh, well, that uh, came down from 6.9% percent in July to 6.2 percent in August and that's something that will have given the Monetary Policy Committee great comfort because uh, that is a real indicator of domestically generated inflation rather than some of the externally generated inflation that we got uh, in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February last year. That said, Bear in mind, the headline rate of inflation is still more than three times the Bank of England's target rate, and that will probably uh, persuade some members of the MPC to vote for a further interest rate hike. And the other thing that's really, really on their mind, which we know about, is wage inflation. Now, the latest uh, wage inflation data we got, that covered the three months to the end of July. Well, the headline number there was 7.8%. Now, that's uh, good news so far as the cost of living crisis is concerned, because it means that uh, wages are now rising appreciably ahead 
ahead of the headline rate of inflation. Naturally, if you, uh, by some measures, it was even higher uh, when you take into account the one-off bonuses that were paid to NHS employees and civil servants during the month of July. You actually get to a figure north of 8%. And that will probably concern some members of the Monetary Policy Committee because uh, they don't like to see wage inflation rising at that sort of level. It feeds through to uh, other measures of inflation over time. So it really is on an absolute knife edge. Now, one other thing to mention, Jane, is that uh, last night the US Federal Reserve, the world's biggest and most important central bank, well, they held interest rates. They, some people had thought that they might go higher, but uh, the, the Fed is some way further down the line uh, than the Bank of England in terms of uh, winning the war against inflation. What the Fed did, they kept rates on hold, but there was quite a hawkish commentary that went with it, and they implied that uh, there would possibly still be other interest rates to come. And I think if we get that from the Bank of England today, if the Monetary Policy Committee decides not to raise interest rates this time around, I suspect we will get some commentary along those lines saying, you know, it's possible that we may have to hike in the future. And there's certainly no sign of any uh, interest rate cuts on the horizon, that's for sure. Ian, thanks a lot. And we will bring you live coverage of the Bank of England's decision from midday here on Sky News. Now, in a historic first, the King will address the French Senate this morning. At a state banquet last night, Charles spoke of his late mother's ties to France and of the firm friendship between France and the UK. Royal correspondent Laura Bundock is in Paris. After all the ceremony yesterday, starting at the Arc de Triomphe and then heading to the Palace of Versailles, I, mean, I think you have to say the French really have done all they can to make the King and Queen feel welcome. It's very interesting looking at some of the French papers today, one of them describing as this visit shining a light, a soothing light to restore a damaged friendship. Others, frankly, just happy to see Mick Jagger on a red carpet at Versailles. But you're right, the engagements continue today. The King going to the Senate. He'll be the first British monarch to ever address the Senate from the floor of the chamber there. He'll be speaking to both houses, a speech in both English and French. It'll really set the tone, I think, of this visit. Every word, every theme will have been carefully thought about. And although, of course, the government will approve what he says, I think we can expect some personal touches. He is bound to talk about his late mother and her connection with France, how much she loved France, how much she used to visit as well. I think also it would be interesting to see how it goes down, how it was received when he gave the speech to the Bundestag in Germany back in March. It lasted 23 minutes and had a two-minute standing ovation at the end. So watch out for the reactions after his speech. After that, though, the day really continues apace. Seven more engagements from sport to a visit to see how the renovations and repairs of Notre Dame are going on after that devastating fire. So another busy day on day two of this state visit. And, of course, the couple then heading to Bordeaux tomorrow for more. Well, let's just bring you these live images that we have. This is uh, the French Senate. These are live. The King Charles is scheduled to make his historic address in uh, just under 10 minutes' time at 9.40. We hope to bring that to you as soon as it starts. In the meantime, let's get a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. The unsettled conditions this week mean it'll often be windy with showers or longer spells of rain. Mostly warm and windy out there now with heavy rain spreading eastwards across Britain. That rain will continue across England and Wales this morning, but probably won't reach the far southeast where it'll be mainly fine. Showery conditions will follow to the northwest. Elsewhere, there'll be sunny spells and blustery showers, some perhaps heavy and thundery, a touch warmer over all. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, it seems that we humans aren't the only ones that can find the noise of cities a little overwhelming. Brazil's pied tamarind monkeys are increasingly using their scent to communicate with each other, marking their territory, because the expanding Amazon city of Manaus is drowning out their calls. But researchers are warning that the scent marking isn't the most effective way for them to communicate over long distances. Of course, you can hear uh, much further away than you can smell. And they are concerned that this could further threaten this already critically endangered species. Coming up on Sky News Breakfast, our Westminster insiders look at the political fallout from the government's shift on net zero. 
and why this painting, completed in apparently just 30 minutes, is going on sale for $10 million. watching Sky News Breakfast. Let's return to one of our top stories now. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak rolling back on the government's net zero policy. He says the British people shouldn't be made to sacrifice more than others. I'll join me now to discuss the fallout from this. James Heal, diary editor at The Spectator and also Rachel Cunliffe, associate political editor at The New Statesman. Thanks so much for coming in to you both. Well, well let's say to us, James, what, what did you make of the Prime Minister's speech and the, and the reaction that we've seen since? I thought it was interesting that, first of all, I think people conflated how the story came about uh, and the breaking of the story uh, with actually the handling of it. And I thought there was a noticeable shift after Rishi Sunak's press conference when he went through a lot of the detail, was clearly on top of the brief, uh, and much more nuanced thereafter. I think that we saw initially a lot of Conservatives coming out, but I think they were the people we would kind of expect to be talking about net zero. Um, and I think now we're just waiting to see what kind of impact it will have, if any, in the polls. And also if we're going to see any more of these kind of announcements on things like schools in the future. Rachel, what impact do you think it will have on the polls? I think it's tricky to measure because if you poll net zero policies, net zero as a policy is very popular. Majority of people support that. When you get into the individual policies like a ban on petrol and diesel cars or a ban on new gas boilers uh, or traffic measures, as we saw in the Uxbridge by-election, then people have more of a mixed reaction. Uh, but I think it's a risk for the Prime Minister to turn net zero, which is a topic that there was political consensus on, Labour and the Conservatives agreeing that it was really important for Britain to be a world leader in this sphere, to turn that into a wedge issue, a culture war issue, in the hopes of, of getting some votes ahead of the, the next election. I think that could end up being more damaging for him than perhaps he realised. Mm. Uh, James, that Goldsmith, 
you know, excoriating criticism mm -hmm. from him last night, saying just that, that the Prime Minister has turned this into a wedge issue, something that he said he, he's only seen on the other side of the pond before now, and that really troubled him. I mean, I, the Prime Minister has to be careful that he doesn't alienate. Yeah, and I think that's why, you know, this has been something that's been rumbling on in the background of Number 10 all over the summer. They've been considering looking at these kind of proposals. Um, but I think if you look at the tone Rishi Sunak was talking about, you know, he's explicitly ruled out things like climate denialism yesterday. It's really about, I think, Rishi Sunak's own views on net zero, which I would, I would classify as slightly more about sceptical and more concerned about the trade-offs. You look at how net zero was implemented in this country. It was Theresa May's legacy project in 2019. Then Boris Johnson, who incidentally at the last election campaigned for a 2040 uh, ban on combustion, internal combustion engines, then shifted it to 2030, uh, was always much more kind of, let's embrace the big idea and then talk about the figures later. Rishi Sunak, as we see in today's Times, was always a bit more sceptical around this. So I think that this is his big pitch. He's had the first year in office. He's been talking about trying to get rid of those crises. Uh, and now it's about kind of making him seen as the serious person who can lead us through these times. Whether all work remains to be seen, but I do think with Zach Goldsmith's criticism, it's interesting that it highlights the tensions on the net zero issue. And you've got people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, who is a big Boris Johnson backer, uh, sort of applauding Rishi Sunak, but you have others like Zach Goldsmith who are against. And I think that shows really the Conservatives have been split on this for a while. Rachel, interesting. We spoke to excuse me, Chris Stark from the UK Climate Change Committee a short while ago, and he said, you know, obviously he does not support the the, the changes. He, he he thinks we should still be doing what was originally said, but he acknowledged that actually, if the government made some big economic pledges in terms of business and in terms of industry, it's perfectly possible for us to meet the twenty thirty target with these things removed from it. I mean. You could say, have the British public been asked to contribute too much to, to this? If, 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 if this goes and it actually doesn't make a, a massive difference to our ability to meet it. Well, that was the point that Rishi Sunak was trying to make in the speech, that the target isn't in question, it's just how we get there. Uh, I think the issue is that he took a lot of things out of the measures that will help us get there without really putting that much in. And it's a bit like saying, oh, yes, I absolutely have a target that I'm going to, to lose some weight, but I'm not going to get up the get off the couch and go for a run and actually do anything that would enable me to meet that target. On, on James's point that it, he's trying to look serious, uh, I think that's definitely the impression that he was trying to give, but this was very, very much a political move. One of the parts of his speech was to list five things that he said he had scrapped, which were things like forcing people to have seven different bins, meat taxes, uh, and, and forcing was it mandatory carpooling, telling people how many people they had to have driving around in their car. Like, None of these were ever government policy. And I think by bringing those things in and saying, I've scrapped things that were never going to happen anyway, he looks disingenuous, he doesn't look serious, and I worry that he does actually look a bit desperate. James, why has he done this now, do you think? Is there a snap election on the horizon? I wouldn't say it's about a snap election. I think it's really... I mean, first of all, I do think this is something of real interest and concern to Rishi Sunak, so I think it was a genuine policy uh, discussion. But also, I think it's about saying, look, guys, we've looked at the books, we're going to be seeing what are the kind of key issues ahead of an election next year. Uh, and I think, as I understand it, the debate's more around spring or autumn. I don't think there's anything going to be in the pipeline for the snap election. Um, but really, I think it's part of a series of announcements. Obviously, they say the handling of it was meant to be on Friday, came out instead on uh, t on Tuesday night instead. Uh, I think it's going to be a series of things in the autumn as we go into that conference season and really trying to show that the Conservatives have got fuel left in the tank and uh, are able to get new policy ideas ahead of the next election. We shall see. James Heal from The Spectator and Rachel Cunner from The New Statesman. Thank you both so much. Well, the Prime Minister's announcement dominates the morning papers and they've given us a flavour of their battle lines that are being drawn. The Sun says Rishi Sunak has given us a break. At last, they comment in their editorial, the Tories have something to sell on the doorstep. The Mail praises the Prime Minister for taking on what it calls the eco-zealots. The Express brands him Honest Rishi. And Sunak spares public net zero pain, is the similarly supportive headline in The Telegraph. But not everybody is on side. The Times calls the decision to hit the brakes on green commitments a gamble. And The Guardian brands it a green bonfire, pointing out the furious reaction from industry and despair of climate scientists. The FT also focuses on the backlash from business. Now, a warning now about flash photography as we bring you the latest pictures from Paris of the Queen and the French First Lady Brigitte Macron. They're announcing a new literary prize at the National Library of France in Paris. Here they both are. Shortly, King Charles is due to speak in the French Senate. That will be a historic first for a British monarch. 
Your Majesty. Well, joining me now is Newsweek's Chief Royal Correspondent, Jack Royston. Uh, Jack, as we look at these pictures of, uh, of the Queen and, and Brigitte Macron, uh, how do you think the monarchs have been received over the last 24 hours or so? I think they've been received very well. I think there was a good turnout of French people, high security, so I don't know how much of a, of a good look the French people managed to get of the King and the Queen, um, but obviously this tour was originally supposed to happen only in the year and was cancelled due to the unrest in France at the time. Um, but I think they've gone down very well. It's been an incredibly glamorous occasion. Um, obviously, the French do glamour better than anybody else. You know, the Hall of Mirrors, where they had dinner, was this very grand uh, location. Uh, Macron looks impeccable in every single photo of him. Um, we've had, you know, actresses like you know, Charlotte Gainsbourg looked incredibly glamorous when she. I mean, it was. was I mean, dinner. arriving in a thunderstorm and yes. still managing to look incredibly yeah. glamorous looking, takes some doing. Doesn't it? <laughs> it does, looking like she's walking through a fashion shoot as the wind blows her dress around. It, they, they do it. Like, like nobody else, the French. Um, and I think there's been a lot of warmth, um, a lot of warmth to Britain as well as to the king. I think, in a way, some um, countries internationally actually quite like doing diplomacy via the British royal family because it takes some of the politics out of it. Um, that, that said, it's all on a bit of a tightrope because, on the one hand, you've got Brexit, which is a thorny issue, and on the other hand, um, obviously, a lot of this tour is being based around climate change and uh, partnership in tackling that, and that is a difficult issue in Britain at the moment with... Rishi Sunak's um, announcement uh, about cars. And so Charles is going to have to be very careful in everything he says uh, with his wording of all, all of his phrasing. Because if he starts talking about, you know, having to hurry up or not wanting to delay or any of these things that are very easy to say when talking about an important issue, it could be interpreted as a political comment. So he's going to have to be quite careful. Uh, and what do we know about the, the, his meeting with Macron yesterday? Do we know much of what they discussed? Um, we, we don't know a huge amount beyond the fact that obviously they would have talked about climate change. I mean, it was in Charles's speech as well. Um, and it's, you know, it's clearly a very important issue to both of them and to the relationship between France and Britain, which I think is, you know, more of a partnership now than it has been at certain points in recent years. So this is... Uh, the climate change is the issue where Britain really has a huge amount to achieve by rolling out Charles, who is this fig global figurehead who's really known for this cause. Um, and so I think the British government will be hoping that Charles will have been able to smooth everything over with Macron in terms of uh, partnership on climate change and sustainability. And as we talk, we're looking at these images from inside the French Senate. Uh, the King was due to start speaking around six minutes ago. It's unusual. If this was in the UK, it would have happened on time. I'm sure we could, <laughs> I'm sure we could say it runs, runs to clockwork over here. Uh, but what can we expect from this uh, statement that he's going to make? W will he be speaking in French? I mean, he spoke in French last uh, night. He did speak in French last night. He's spoken in French on a number of his past visits to France. So I think we are, we are going to expect some French. Um, and I think he, yeah, he would hit those big topics like climate change, I'm sure. It's obviously this is his first visit to France as king. This is also, you know, his first address to to the Senate as as king. So it's going to be a big um, historical moment. Um, it will, in terms of what he says, I mean, it will all be very warm. I think it will all be very safe. It will all be very much about partnership and cooperation and what a great entente cordiale Britain and France have with each other. Um, and really, it is, you know, it is very much going to be about trying to warm up the French to the idea of Britain as an ally you know, in the aftermath of Brexit. He's quite a linguist, isn't he, Charles? We, we saw him talking at the Bundestag in, in, in German, Germany not yeah. that long ago in yeah, yeah, yeah. flawless German, people said. It's very impressive. And actually, the French already, before the visit even began, put out a little video on social media of a montage of all his past appearances in France where he spoke in French. And it, it, he even, you know, he's been doing this since back in his... I well, must have been the 30s, I think. Um, and he's very convincing. You know, his French, his French accent is good. He doesn't come across as though he just learned one phrase and that's it. Um, so, yeah, he is, he is an impressive and convincing linguist. In terms of, of, of his visit and the warmth that he's receiving, how do you think it compares to Queen Elizabeth's visits in the past? Um, I think that the French were, were positive about the Queen as well. Interestingly, actually, Charles mentioned one of her past visits to the Palace of Versailles, which was in 1972, and that was actually to celebrate Britain joining the EU. Um, and he dropped that reference in without actually giving the contextual background to it. He told a kind of funny story about how the French uh, at the airport in Paris um, stopped them bringing in English wine. But, um, you know, I think that the Queen has largely been positively received everywhere she's gone and she was a hugely respected uh, global 
figure. And I think the, Fr the French had respect for her as well. And of course, this visit was delayed. He was meant to visit mm. uh, earlier in the year, but, but delayed uh, because of the riots. It's not often that a royal visit gets postponed, is it? No, it's not. And it was exceptional circumstances. Obviously, it didn't actually directly relate to Charles himself. Um, it was, you know, French anger at French government policy. So it's entirely a French issue, but obviously very understandable that I think neither side wanted Charles to be caught up in that situation or the royal visit to be used as a kind of political football. The police also, you know, it's intense police presence around any kind of massive state visit like this, and they were very thoroughly preoccupied <laughs> dealing with events on the streets of Paris at the time. So very normal um, thing for, very normal response response to a very abnormal situation, but the French do like a stripe, don't they? So. We're just seeing the King arriving now at the French Senate. Uh, the weather in Paris this morning is inclement as it is here in the UK, it seems. Um, how important do you think... Oh, those pictures are stopping there. How important do you, do you think it is, this visit, generally, for, for UK-French relations? They have been strained in recent years mm. because of Brexit. I mean, you pointed out that, of course, that the King steers away from, from politics, but in terms of the entente cordiale, this is important, isn't it? It's very important. I think that people expected that when Charles became king, he would target for his first overseas visit some of the, the countries around the world where he is king. You know, your Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica, these kinds of countries. Um, but he didn't. He targeted our two most important European allies, Germany and France. And I think that shows really where British diplomacy is focusing right now. We've obviously left the EU, but they remain our most important strategic partners and so the charm offensive is maintain, build and strengthen that friendship with France and Germany because that is ultimately the route to how Britain exercises its power on the global stage and meets all of the challenges that the British government are trying to face, you know, economic and uh, on climate as well. And, and what does France get out of this visit, do you think? Well, honestly, I think Macron is quite pleased to get a little bit of glamour into his uh, reign. He gets to present himself as the global statesman in a way that is kind of free of the uh, tension and, uh, you know, that comes with his relationship with Rishi Sunak because of all that political history and the kind of conflict. This gives him a space where, and this is actually what the monarchy gives to Britain, it's a space where people can unite and step back from the kind of uh, Yabu politics that you get in Westminster, um, step back from the argument and just have a much more warm, much more friendly event. And that's what it gives him. It gives him an opportunity to present himself in a, uh, a very positive PR spotlight um, without having to get into the trickier parts of British and French relations. So we saw yesterday, we saw uh, the King and the Queen uh, doing something of a, of a walkabout. We saw the uh, event in Versailles last night, the Senate today. What else is on the agenda for the King and Queen there? They are going to be uh, visiting some businesses that have been working in the area of sustainability. So again, it's back to that big issue of, of uh, the climate and how the economy reorganises in order to meet the needs of tackling climate change. So we're, we're going to see some of that. And again, it's going to be back to that issue of Charles having to be very careful what he says. So he's, he's got this speech uh, that he's giving at the Senate today. I think it will, in all honesty, probably have been run past Downing Street and they will probably have been given a chance to read over it and make sure that they're happy that he's not going to say anything controversial. But he might find himself later in the day in situations where he's talking in a more off-the-cuff, off-hand manner. And that is, I think, where the risk increases, that he could accidentally say something that is interpreted as a veiled swipe at Rishi Sunak's uh, policy U-turn. So he's going to have to be on his best behaviour. Do you think we are as phased by the monarch potentially making some off-the-cuff off political comment now than perhaps we would have been if it was the Queen? Because we know Prince Charles's history, we know his yeah. strong feelings about the, the environment, for example. We do. Uh, yeah, we absolutely do. We know what he thinks already. I'm sure that he's not particularly happy with what Rishi Sunak has done. He does, though, need to follow the rules, and so it's part of... Uh, the kind of monitoring how this all plays out. We're gonna, we're, it's the, quest, the big question that preceded a session was, would Charles be able to switch gears on becoming king 
and be less inclined to get stuck into political issues. And the environment was the big one that everybody wanted to watch out for. So in that respect, it will, it will be interesting to see whether he manages to play this correctly or not. Um, if he were to slip up, I don't think it would damage him hugely. It would probably be more damaging to Sunak. Um, like you say, we know what Charles thinks already, but also uh, the people who would disagree with him, who would take the kind of pro-Sunak approach, are all ardent royalists. Um, so in that respect, he kind of has that buffer that he's never, you know, he's never going to turn people against the monarchy by being pro-climate change because the people who uh, are concerned about the pace of economic change triggered by the climate change agenda, they are all very pro-monarchy and they're not about to abandon the monarchy anytime soon. If you're just tuning our way, watching Sky News Breakfast, this is live footage of the inside of the French Senate. The King is due to address the Senate in the next few minutes. So for the first time in history, he's the only British monarch that will ever have spoken from the Senate chamber. We're expecting him to talk about the close friendship between the UK and France. We saw the King arrive a short time ago. We think what is happening, there was a guard of honour that, that lined his route uh, into the Salle de Conferences, uh, where he's now meeting representatives from the Senate and the National Assembly, uh, and is also apparently signing a visitor's book before he will enter the chamber to deliver his address. And, and with me now is Jack Royston, Chief Royal Correspondent at Newsweek. And, and Jack, we don't know exactly what, what the King is going to say, but We've touched on some of the broad themes. Just recap for us briefly, what do we expect him to talk about today? Well, I think climate change is going to be the big one that for the... I mean, it's a big theme for this whole visit, and I'm sure it will be in this speech too, but also it's going to be about French and British partnership. It's going to be about trying to warm the French up to the idea that actually Britain and France do still have a very important union, um, even after Brexit. I don't think he will mention Brexit explicitly, but as I mentioned earlier, he did kind of draw in this indirect reference to the Queen's past visit to the Palace of Versailles, uh, which was to celebrate British membership of the EU. Um, he can't obviously directly reference Brexit because it's too politically controversial, but he will very much want to be presenting Britain and France as an alliance, as a, as a pairing, even with Britain outside the European Union. Um, obviously, I think British-French relationships are becoming closer. The British government and the French government are becoming closer on a number of things, um, you know, led by Macron's own initiatives. Um, and Charles will want to be kind of uh, laying the ground for that. Jack, Jack Royston, Chief Royal Correspondent at Newsweek, thanks very much. Well, stay with Sky News. Uh, we're going to uh, bring you this live coverage of the King's speech to the French Senate uh, after this short break. Stay with Sky News. Welcome back to Sky News. Uh, let's now look at uh, those live pictures, as you can see, of uh, King Charles III. In the French Senate, he uh, enjoyed a state banquet in Versailles last night, part of this uh, delayed 
uh, state visit to France after it was uh, postponed earlier in the summer due to some uh, protests uh, happening in France at the time, not related specifically, at least, um, to his impending visit, which has thus far seemingly been uh, rather broadly welcomed uh, by... Uh, the people of uh, France, or at least the ones in and around uh, where he's been. You can see James Cleverly there, the Foreign Secretary, uh, standing just behind him as he takes uh, his seat in the French Senate. Uh, he will be the first British monarch to address the French Senate. He's expected to address the Senate in both French and English. You'll be pleased to know we have a, a live French translator standing by uh, for that. And uh, a very warm welcome of applause there from the French Senate, the Upper House in France, and I think we're just uh, awaiting for him to be uh, introduced and brought in. Of course, uh, a similar picture, perhaps with a little bit more, uh, as is typical in France, splendour about it, um, to when King Charles uh, addressed the Bundestag, uh, of course, uh, earlier this year, to uh, very rave uh, reviews as well, where he also then spoke in the native tongue. Uh, rather impressively, we'll be uh, all able to judge his French uh, shortly. He spoke briefly in French last yeah. night at his... State banquet. Let's listen in. Le président du Sénat. Uh, now. Mesdames et messieurs les ministres. Mesdames Mr. Et messieurs president, les Madam President, Madam President, Senators, les députés, and Lady Senators, Deputies, and Lady Deputies. Pour que la présidente de l'Assemblée nationale prenne la parole dans l'hémicycle du Sénat, il faut un grand événement. This Et c'est un effet, un moment historique. Event. And it is indeed a historical moment that we are living. And this is a great honor, Your Majesty, who knows France very well, but who comes for the first time as the sovereign of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. This visit is due to have a parliamentary aspect because one must acknowledge that if the United Kingdom required royalties from Parliament, all the parliaments of the world would be involved. Since Enlightenment, France has shared on a legislative basis, Montesquieu theorized on the separation of powers and talked about the practice on the other side of the channel, and it was Voltaire and his followers, Mirabeau himself, several times a victim of royal arbitration, supported Great Britain, and it was in his journey and his <coughs> texts on England, and he gives credit to his neighbours for their full respect of the rights of man and referring to the glorious revolution of 1688. He published his own pamphlet, and it was the will Mirabeau expressed the desire of the people of the first National Assembly in order to adopt the British model of constitutional monarchy. It is almost the English who lived the French Revolution. The French monarchy did not support it. 231 years ago, the people chose a republic. Thus, both our people have influenced each other, rivals for a long time, for more than a century, always as allies to defend democracy and the rights of man. The memorial cal calendar is there to remind us next year, in 2024, we will celebrate at the same time 120 years of the Entente Cordiale and the 80th anniversary of the Normandy landings. We celebrate this long partnership that we are, have lived through Today, 
war has returned on European soil, and when the most basic values are threatened through an illegal and illegitimate use of force, both our countries are once again on the same side, on the side of international law and respect of human rights. Permanent members of the UN Security Council, both members of NATO, two democracies of influence, it counts in a world disinformation and destabilization. Finally, as a woman, first president of a French national parliament, I would like to welcome the memories of these women who, more than in France, were able to help develop the mentality so that both sexes have the same rights. I would like to pay tribute to the English suffragettes in 1918 and in observing English women, their commitment, their public spiritedness during the Blitz when General de Gaulle signed the order on the 21st of April 1944, which finally allowed French people to be free. In London, too, during the war, a young Frenchman who joined Free France discovered that we could buy allowing women to control on through contraception, a future deputy and a future senator who obtained in 1967 the legalization of the pill in France at a time when, in the world, Les droits des femmes and sont remis en question sur la base de la démocratie. Les droits des femmes, il est bon de rappeler cette période qui est beaucoup plus importante que cette anecdote. La liberté ne se segmente pas. On est libre, mais on est libre. Nous sommes libres ou nous ne sommes pas libres. Nous voulons être dans tous les domaines de la vie. Nous voulons être dans tous les domaines de la vie. Nous voulons être dans tous les domaines de la vie. Nous voulons être dans tous les domaines de la vie. Nous voulons être dans tous les domaines de la vie. Nous voulons être dans tous les domaines de la vie. Nous voulons être dans tous live through the common ideal of freedom and respect of human life, each in its own way, but always hand in glove, hand in hand, when one needs to be firm. We know that together we will make the world progress on the improvement of the environment and biodiversity, and we know it is our investment from you, I'm of you, with this big question of the millennium, Marianne, Comme le déclara and Britain, à la as Winston communes, Churchill said at the House of Commons, sagesse, in bon his wi wi wisdom, did not want French people aussi, to be the same as English people. He said also that France and Great Britain have followed the path of freedom, but as long as they have a common cause, it will be difficult to uh, destroy them. It's difficult to sum up in just a few minutes a partnership, but I know that we understand each other and that we will continue to follow a common path. Both countries Seront donnés une suite enthousiasmante à cette première bande dessinée de C'est tout le sens de votre visite. Et c'est pourquoi je suis fier. C'est la raison de votre visite. Et c'est pourquoi je suis fier. Je suis fier de la représentation nationale. Au nom de la représentation nationale, je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Yep. Madame la Présidente de l'Assemblée nationale, Madam President of the National Assembly, Mr. Secretary General of the Commonwealth and Development, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, and dear parliamentary colleagues. C'est un moment inédit 
It is an exceptional moment that Your Majesty pays to us by being president at the time of national parliament in the first multi-secular, for the first time, the British sovereign will speak before the French parliament united in its diverse, political diversity and your chambers. I welcome, I welcome, I welcome the president of the National Assembly, colleagues, and those sitting amongst your senators, I welcome the members of the Cham Chamber of Commune, the House of Commune, Commons and the House of Lords that are joining us this, this morning. Thank you. Your Majesty, you have wished to speak publicly in what you are doing in your public visit, your esteem between the oldest parliamentary nation, the United Kingdom, and French, the French Parliament, the habeas corpus has opened the path a modern, a modern parliament, like Chateaubriand, one needed to be president in the Mémoire of Outre-Tombe, the freedom contained seems to be take place in Westminster, end of Chateaubriand's quote, quote, parliamentary democracy is the purest antidote to deal with political discussions. And for both our countries, we are talking about passion, sometimes united, often allies, competitors for a long time. The United Kingdom and France have been allies in the darkest moment. The United Kingdom, Great Britain, was a country of refuge. There was a time in 1940 when the capital of France was moved to London to edify, to have, to face totalitarian in adversity, the prophetic comment of Victor Hugo, the United King England is always a sister of France. As Victor Hugo said, today, as we are commemorating next spring the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy, the destiny of the United Kingdom is very, very closely linked to Europe. Brexit has not changed anything. Your nation is a vital for European security. The United Kingdom and France, both countries with military tradition, yours, that has never been invaded since. Um, Guillaume Le Conquin, the United Kingdom and France, on several occasions, have always respected each other since the Entente called Dial, almost 120 years ago, they are side by side, they're loyal in supporting Ukraine, which has been progressed. Your Majesty, you have chosen, like Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth II, to be present at the Senate. We want to pay homage to the territory of the Republic and British citizens represented by the Senate. This homage various for the preservation, which is so close to your heart and constitutes one of the great causes of our times, territorial communities 
have had so many close relations and they are the most solid basis of our friendship. Through the territories, we see the genius of a nation. It's not my idea. It comes from the, the most French of English historians, Theodore Zeldin, Oui, concédons-le à notre fierté nationale. Il faut bien un historien britannique de l'Ontario pour réussir à décrypter les rares sont les pays européens qui, comme le Royaume-Uni, like ont la même à considérer le monde dans sa même aspiration to consider globalization and to have links of solidarity with the most vulnerable countries. The increasing division between North and South is only neo-colonialism. France and the United Kingdom have the necessary resources to propose a new world, balanced cooperation, security, development that is long-lasting, and particular attention for the youth of their countries. The time seems to me to come to gather the great families of the French-speaking world and the Commonwealth, that they have an, an ambition and a language, a common language, what General de Gaulle had foreseen, who confided in Winston Churchill, and I quote him, more we progress as French, and this, this is really a, quite a, an appropriate quote, Your Majesty, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth had declared in 1996, during another official state visit, that of Jacques Chirac in London, and I quote her, it is, it is true that we don't drive on the same side of the road, but it's also true that we, we are moving forward in the same direction. This comment that seems to us so British. is such a, such a British comment um, describes an absolute different. truth. Our paths may be different, parfois. and Et sometimes they diverge and defy logic de Londres, and geography. Il nous ramène toujours à Paris. From London, we always go back to Paris, Ainsi and we go from Paris back to London. That is French Cartesian approach for England. Your Majesty, through the United Parliamentarians and the whole French nation, is listening to you. Thank you very much. Mr. President, Madame Mr. La President, Mesdames Madame les President, Sénatrices et Messieurs les Sénateurs, Mesdames Senators et Messieurs and Lady les Sénateurs, Deputies and Lady Merci Deputies, thank you votre mot très many much for your moving words. I'm flattered to have been invited de vos deux chambres à Paris. by the Presidents of Paris, of both houses, to speak here in this hallowed chamber, which has been the upper house in French politics in one form or another since 1799. I'm all too conscious that my 
visit falls ahead of the formal rentrée of both chambers of your parliament. And I can only apologize for having intruded on your break. C'est la raison pour laquelle je suis très touché par votre and présence. And the reason why I'm particularly touched by your presence here today. La longévité de votre démocratie <coughs> est reflétée aussi dans la longue continuité de votre démocratie, embodied by this august legislature, is reflected too in the enduring friendship between our nations and our people. Une expérience partagée. Is a partnership forged through shared experience and one which remains utterly vital as together we confront the chain challenges of our world. Quite simply, the United Kingdom will always be one of France's closest allies and best friends. Yesterday, my wife and I began our visit at the tomb of Là, the unknown soldier. There, we remembered, remembered all those who have fallen si in defense of, of the freedoms that our two countries Au hold dear. Grand nation. Nous avons at the very heart of this great nation, we stood with you debout. in quiet Côte solidarity, vous, just as our people se have stood together so si many times before. I was reminded that it was there at the Arc de Triomphe 16 months ago that with characteristic generosity of spirit, you marked the platinum jubilee of my beloved mother, the late Queen Elizabeth II. On that occasion, President Macron described Her Late Majesty as the golden thread that binds our nations. Est décédée l'année dernière. Ma when my mother died almost exactly one year ago, my family and I were moved beyond measure by the tributes that were paid to her across France. This morning, I read again the deeply touching words of condolence that Your Excellencies, Presidents of the National Assembly and the Senate wrote at that time. First, Her Majesty La Reine, come ayant you described Her Late Majesty as having embodied the dignity of our own democracy and that, as she loved France, France loved her. I can hardly describe how much these words meant to me, to my entire family. I can only thank you and the people of France for the great kindness you showed to us and our people at a time of such grief. In the rich and complex tapestry of the relationship between France and the United Kingdom, my mother's golden thread will forever shine brightly. Let it inspire us all to continue to weave the connections between our two countries with determination, hope, and with love. Inspired and encouraged by my grandmother's and my late mother's example, France has been an essential part of the fabric of my own life for as long as I can remember. Indeed, as I have been astonished to discover, this is my 35th official visit to France. Each and every time, I have been struck by the warmth of the welcome I have always received and by the immense good that can be accomplished when France and the United Kingdom work together. Now, on the occasion of my first state visit to France, my belief in the indispensable relationship between our countries is as firm as it ever has been. Today, in confronting the greatest challenges of our time, we continue the work of those who came before us. 
when General de Gaulle spoke to the French people from London in June of 1940, he said, remember this, France does not stand alone. She is not isolated. She can make common cause with the British. De Gaulle's confidence in our alliance was well-founded. Two days before the appel du 18 juin, Sir Winston Churchill's government had offered France an indissoluble political union, which would have allowed our two peoples to continue the fight for justice and freedom as a single country. Just two months after that historic broadcast, my grandfather, King George VI, proudly wearing the crimson ribbon of the Légion d'honneur, joined de Gaulle at Morville Camp near Aldershot to inspect 2,500 of the free French troops. The common determination expressed that day sustained us through, sustained us through the long and bitter years of that war and drove us forward together to victory. Cette éclatante illustration de notre engagement envers la liberté franco-britannique se déploie en and democracy remains intensely relevant to this day. At this present time, our armed forces trained together in the combined joint expeditionary force deployed together with UN peacekeeping forces and through the UN Security Council, the G7 and NATO assume together a joint responsibility for European and global security. Now, more than 80 years since we fought side by side for the liberation of Europe, we once again face unprovoked aggression on our continent. Our alliance and our resolve are as important as ever. Together, we stand in resolute solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Together, we are steadfast in our determination that Ukraine will triumph and that our cherished freedoms will prevail. Of so much that we hold dear. Just as we stand together against military aggression, so must we strive together to protect the world from our most existential challenge of all, that of global warming, climate change, and the catastrophic destruction of nature. Jacques-Yves Cousteau a dit si sagement. Jacques-Yves Cousteau said so wisely, for most of history, man has had to fight nature. Il commence à comprendre que pour se vivre, il doit la protéger. Yeah, yeah. Cette vision yeah. Est this vision is even more relevant in the 21st century in spite of the challenges our continent is facing it is urgent to see measures taken I have long felt that our businesses can play a most vital role working in partnership and harmony with our governments and invest millions to develop solutions that can achieve success. With President Macron, that I will be this afternoon, Dans la collaboration, business leaders from France and Britain whose collaboration, dans une croissance propre, innovations and investments in clean growth and 
preserving our precious biodiversity are offering essential global leadership. And I have been reflecting on the opportunities that members of the Commonwealth and the international organization of the Francophonie share. I hope they will very much that they might be avenues for future collaboration, for example, to find a way to strengthen cooperation around sustainable Ladies development. Our two governments are working in partnership to address so many global challenges, <clears throat> and yet, as ever, it is our people who are the true <clears throat> driving force of our relationship. Our friendship and warm familiarity are fortified by each new connection between us. It is renewed by each newfound joy in the culture of the other and each reminder of how much we share. Millions of us visit each other's countries every year, a joy that we are now rediscovering after the disruption wrought by the pandemic. Tens of thousands of British rugby fans are currently following their national team around France, enjoying the fantastic spectacle of the Rugby World Cup my son and daughter-in-law among them. Even when our national teams are drawn up on opposite ends of the pitch, they do so with mutual admiration and a shared commitment to the rules of the game, on which I will say only, pas de Cuba et que le meilleur gagne. And, of course, hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens have chosen to live their lives permanently in each other's countries. This vibrant exchange between our people makes us immeasurably stronger, happier and more prosperous. Nos artistes continue to s'inspire les uns des autres. Our artists continue to draw inspiration from one another as they always have, blending old and new and creating work that is fresh, complex, and enriching. And Claude Monet's unforgettable pictures of London and of the London of the fog in London, which so fascinated French visitors, to David Hockney's most recent iPad depictions of the changing landscapes of Normandy or the invigorating collaboration between British designer Paul Smith and the Picasso Museum in Paris. There is a universality in our shared artistic tradition, traditions, indeed, Right now, my darling wife is celebrating this artistic collaboration by launching the inaugural UK-France Literary Prize, recognising exceptional contemporary fiction published in French and English at the extraordinary Bibliothèque Nationale de France. my wife and I will visit Bordeaux, the first city to be twinned with a British city, Bristol, in 1947. This shared link is just one of a countless number of connections between our towns and cities, our communities, our businesses, and our educational establishments. It is our people, through all that they do together, who are writing each new chapter of our history, so that a more secure, more prosperous world might be the inheritance of the next generation. Our young people must, therefore, be at the heart of our shared endeavours. Ce matin, je me réjouis donc de rejoindre des jeunes. So this morning, I look forward to joining young people in the 19th arrondissement of Paris and in Saint Denis, who are being supported into work through community initiatives by supporting our young people. We invest in our future 
an investment that will be repaid after this time is over. Mr. President, Madam President, Madam President, Senators and Lady Senators, Deputies and Lady Deputies, nearly 120 years ago, my great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII, committed himself on behalf of the United Kingdom to the Entente Cordiale and to the bond between our two countries. That bond was sanctified by the immeasurable sacrifices of the last century and burnished by each instance of our shared enterprise. Today, it is in our hands, having passed with pride from father to daughter, mother to son, just as it has been handed through the generations of my own family. For the time that is granted to me as king, I pledge to do whatever I can to strengthen the indisputable, indispensable relationship between the United Kingdom and France. And today, I invite you to join me in this endeavor. Together, our potential is limitless. Let us Therefore, cherish and nurture our Entente Cordiale. Let us renew it for future generations so that I would like to propose it also becomes an Entente for la durabilité, for sustainability, in order to tackle the global change global climate and biodiversity emergency more effectively. Commitment to each other and to the values we so proudly share, a commitment inspired by the example of the past and emboldened to grapple with the immense challenges in the world around us. As neighbors, friends, partners, and allies there is no challenge to which we cannot rise, as we have done so often in the past. Let us stride forward with hope and courage, and let us do so together. Thank you very much. Your Majesty, the applause that we have seen, we do not despair, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, parliamentarians, I ask you to remain seated until the National Assembly and the National Assembly and accompany His Majesty to thank him for his presence this morning. Thank you, Your Majesty.
King Charles III there, the first British monarch to address uh, the French Senate and receiving almost a full minute of uh, a very warm uh, set of applause and a standing ovation as he wrapped up his uh, speech, which went on for about 15, 20 uh, minutes. Uh, as he did wrap it up, he referenced his uh, great-great-grandfather, Edward VII, uh, 120 years earlier, committing himself to the Entente Cordiale between France and the UK. Uh, and uh, King Charles saying, for his time uh, as king, I pledge to do whatever I can to uh, be in the in indispensable commitment between the two countries. Together, our potential is unlimited. And he said he would treasure and cherish the Entente uh, cordial. In fact, as he was wrapping things up there, he did just bring in the word sustainability again, and that topic did come up during uh, the speech. He talked about uh, the importance uh, of the alliance between the two countries, which in particular he started by saying more than 80 years since we fought side by side for the liberation of Europe. Uh, it's an alliance and a resolve that's as important as ever, and we stand in, solid, in resolute solidarity with the Ukrainian people uh, at the moment, but he went on during that part of the speech to talk too about standing together on global warming and climate change, which he described as the most existential uh, threat of all. He said, uh, urgent to see uh, measures taken. And he said specifically, I have long felt our business can play uh, a vital role in partnership with uh, governments. He did say out of the political aisle there, thus, um, perhaps keeping himself out of any hot water, but, of course, the timing of making such overt comments like that, comments which he may well have made no matter what, given his passion on the issue, will no doubt be dissected in the uh, hours ahead, given the announcement from the Prime Minister yesterday to relax some of the sub-commitments uh, to the UK reaching net zero by 2050 while maintaining that ultimate commitment to reach net zero by 2050. In fact, as... The King was making that speech. The Prime Minister did tweet on that very topic. The final in a long thread of tweets uh, was uh, to say that uh, this is the Prime Minister tweeting during that speech. I care about reaching net zero by 2050, but on the current path, we risk losing the consent of the British people. No one has had the courage to look the people in the eye and explain what's really involved. That's wrong, and it changes with this new approach to meeting uh, net zero. So interesting, different messages there uh, on that topic coming out. Uh, from the head of government of the United Kingdom and the head of state of the United Kingdom during the course of that speech. Uh, if we just go back to some of the other headlines from the beginning of that speech from King Charles III, it started with a joke in French, no easy thing, of course, uh, which was uh, rewarded with uh, wide uh, laughter within the, the Senate there. He apologised uh, to the attendees for... Uh, intruding on their break, uh, the French Assembly and the Senate not, uh, in fact, sitting uh, at the moment, but, of course, returned for this particular uh, speech from the King of England. Uh, he spoke uh, often throughout that about uh, the partnership and the shared values of the two uh, countries and uh, said uh, the UK will always be one of France's closest allies and best uh, friends. He also thanked uh, both the French President, uh, the French parliamentarians and the French people uh, for uh, the moving words uh, from across France uh, when Queen Elizabeth II died. Right, I want to get a little bit of uh, reaction now from our Laura Bundock, uh, ro royal correspondent, who is in the room there uh, for the speech. And, and Laura, we, we've just summarised some of the key takeaways from the content of the speech, which perhaps we'll come to again in, in a moment. But first and foremost, sum up for us the mood, which on camera looked incredibly warm and supportive from French parliamentarians for the King. It certainly was, and the King making uh, a reflection within the speech on the warmth of the welcome that he had received, not just on this visit, but on the other 34 official visits he'd, he'd made previously in the past. This, of course, is first state visit as, as monarch now. This very much felt like a, a set-piece speech, didn't it, setting out the theme, uh, the message of this trip, which is one of rebuilding and restoring relations after Brexit. The King making absolutely no reference to Brexit whatsoever. It was interesting, though, listening to the, one of the politicians who introduced him. Uh, he was the only one who did mention that, who said that Brexit has changed nothing, I think, in respect of, of the alliance, the relationship, um, and, and the, the common cause that, that France and the UK shared. So this trip was very much about... Uh, the king using the, the soft power of the monarchy to, to stress the things that the UK and France have in common rather than the things that have divided them. Because let's be honest, the, 
the bumpy ride, the turbulence of Brexit, uh, the difficult kind of factious relationship with previous prime ministers, I think, uh, have caused issues with that relationship. But uh, the word friendship, I noticed, pops up time and time again. And I think there was a, there was a, an arc to what the King was talking about, obviously thanking uh, his host uh, for, for, for hosting him, but speaking very fondly of his mother, reflecting on how Emmanuel Macron had, had described her as the golden thread um, that unites Britain and, and France, and saying in his speech there, she is the golden thread that will forever shine brightly, and how the two countries should use that thread to inspire us, to weave the connections between us. References, too, about the war in Ukraine, the alliance and the shared um, resolve the two countries have to, to, to stand in solidarity supporting Ukraine. That was a theme we heard mentioned in the German parliament, too. And then, of course, on to the climate, an issue we know the king cares very deeply about. And, you know, some could say, look, this is the controversial part of the speech in many ways. He knows, and his advisors certainly would be well aware um, that back in the UK, there it has become a big political issue, but here he was speaking very um, clearly about the environment, his commitment to the climate, talking about the entente cordiale, but a new entente, an entente of sustainability. That was his, his desire in that. He spoke, I think, comfortably. I mean, most of it was in French, over 18 minutes, 18 and a half minutes, with this uh, round of applause that was the floor of the Senate, rose to its feet for nearly two minutes to give a standing ovation at the end. I think the speech went down well. It certainly ticked the boxes when it came to stressing, as I say, the themes of this visit, which is about restoring, renewing, rekindling that relationship between Britain and France.